Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Councilmember Steve Levin, Chair of the Council's Committee on General Welfare. I want to thank you all for coming to our hearing on reducing food insecurity in New York City. Today, we will also be focusing our attention on food insecurity among college students, and I want to thank my colleague, Councilmember Inez Barron, Chair of the Higher Education Committee, for joining me today and for bringing attention to this important issue. I also want to thank the food justice advocates and emergency food providers who work very hard every day to ensure that every New Yorker in need has access to, su to a sufficient amount of nutritious food. According to the USDA, an estimated 1.2 million New York City residents were food insecure in 2016. And while this is a decrease from previous years, food insecurity in New York City is still 12 percent higher than the national rate. In New York City, 1.57 million people rely on SNAP benefits to meet their basic nutritional needs. And while SNAP is crucial in our fight against hunger, families often cannot stretch their benefits to the end of the month and must turn to our network of food pantries and soup kitchens to fill the gap. This fact is painfully obvious at this time because the government shutdown last month resulted in SNAP recipients receiving their February benefits in mid-January and are trying to make that stretch until March. Those February benefits are likely long gone as we approach the public school winter break and children are losing free school meals. Additionally, on February 1, 2019, the USDA posted a proposed rule to limit the waivers that states have been receiving for able-bodied adults without dependents, otherwise known as ABODs. Federal law imposes a time limit for able-bodied adults without dependents to receive SNAP benefits for three months in three years if they do not meet certain work requirements. States have been permitted to apply for waivers to areas of high, un for areas of high unemployment, but the proposed rule seeks to put so many restrictions on these waivers that the current areas covered by the waiver would be reduced by 75%. <coughs> I urge everybody here to submit a comment expressing their strong opposition to the proposed rule during the 60-day public comment period that ends on April 2, 2019. One easy way to do that is to go to the Food Research and Action Center, otherwise known as FRAC, website. There you will find a link about this proposed rule, plenty of information, great talking points, and a form to submit comments right on their page. As federal policies continue to have negative impacts on our city, I want to thank the food pantries and soup kitchens that have continued to fill the gaps, especially since the Great Recession. Anti-hunger initiatives are a core component of the social safety net. An estimated 1.4 million New York City <coughs> residents rely on emergency food pr programs each year, and pantries and kitchens are continuing to see an increase in demand every year despite an improving economy. According to a food bank survey last year, over half of soup kitchens and food pantries reported running out of food, and 29% reported turning people away because of the lack of food. In last year's budget, my colleagues and I successfully negotiated an $8.7 million baseline increase in the Emergency Food Assistance Program, otherwise known as EFAP, from the city for a total baseline amount of $18.1 million. And I want to thank uh, my colleague on the committee, Barry Gradenchik, for his unwavering advocacy for this. I'm proud of the Council's commitment to securing our enhanced <laughs> city's so, uh, safety net programs. And I also want to thank uh, our Speaker Corey Johnson for making this a top priority <coughs> in his budget negotiations with the Mayor. However, we must do more to ensure that no New Yorker goes hungry. I want to acknowledge the Administration's efforts to increase food access across the city through various programs including Access NYC, which I think we'll see a demonstration of, where applicants can apply for SNAP online, client-initiated scheduling for SNAP interviews on demand, and the Food Assistance Collaborative aimed to build and expand the capacity of food pantries across New York City. We can need to continue to work together to ensure, to ensure that no New Yorker misses a meal. At this time, I'd like to acknowledge my colleagues who are here today. We are joined by Councilmember Barry Grudenchik, of Queens, Councilmember Bob Holden of Queens, Councilmember Adrian Adams of Queens as well, of course my colleague uh, and co-chair Inez Barron of Brooklyn, uh, and we expect to be joined by more council members uh, as the hearing goes on. Lastly, I'd like to thank the staff of the General Welfare Committee, Aminta Kilowan, Senior Counsel, Tanya Cyrus, and C Crystal Pond, Senior Policy Analysts, 
and Julia Harris, finance analyst, for putting this hearing together. I'd also like to thank my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, and my legislative director, Elizabeth Adams. And now I'm pleased to turn it over to my co-chair for this hearing, uh, co-chair uh, of the Higher Education Committee, Inez Barron. Thank you, Chair Levin. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I'd like to wish everyone a good morning, and for those of you who celebrate Valentine's Day, happy Valentine's Day. I'm Councilmember Inez Barron, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Higher Education. And we are joining the Committee on General Welfare to hold this oversight hearing on reducing food insecurity in New York City, including perspectives on this issue as it relates to college students. But first, I want to say we are midway in the month known as Black History Month. It was a tribute that was started by Carter G. Woodson to acknowledge the contributions of blacks. The noted black historian, Dr. John Henry Clark, said, quote, history is a clock that, tell, that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. Dr. Clark reminds us, quote, the first light of human consciousness and the world's first civilization was in Africa, the country with the highest concentration of mineral wealth which contributed to its being targeted by greedy capitalist nations. For nearly 600 years, Africa was robbed of its greatest resources, its people. Hundreds of millions were kidnapped, forced into human trafficking, and conscripted into uncompensated labor. Africans were stolen from the lush, rich vegetation of the motherland, where they had access to fufu, to yams, to goobers, which are peanuts, rice, and other, gross, and other grains. And they were transported here and constrained to frugal, bare subsistence diet of the ears, pigs, and entrails of pigs. The ears, feet, and entrails of pigs. Yet they built the economy of this nation that denied them the benefits of their labor. So today, as we examine the situation of hunger, which now has a euphemistic title uh, that we're looking at, food insecurity, but hunger, particularly in New York City and at the CUNY, and the CUNY system, we will explore how New York City can adopt measures to ensure that as we claim our title of progressiveness and humanitarianism and concern for all people that we can point to particular specific programs that are address that address the issue back to my other comments there is certain irony in today being Valentine's Day for today is synonymous with love flowers candy and nice meals but for others today is just another day of making tough choices between eating or paying the rent, or eating and purchasing a metro car to get to work or school. Indeed, hunger and food insecurity is something that for far too many New Yorkers, they endure on a regular basis, including some of you who bravely came here today to testify. And I want to especially thank you for your willingness to share your perspectives with us. The City University of New York, of which I am a proud alum, has legislatively mandated mission to serve as a vehicle for the upward mobility of the disadvantage of the city of New York. CUNY student bond very much reflects this mission. 42% of CUNY students come from families with incomes lower than 20% annually. 45% are first generation college students. 12% are supporting students of, and of these many are single parents. A quarter of the student body is black, and a third is Latino. And we do want to acknowledge that we, knew how, we have a new chancellor after a year of not having one, and we want to welcome him to his responsibility, uh, the president, former president of Queens College, Felix Matos Rodriguez. Even though we all live here today in one of the richest cities in the world and attend the country's largest public urban university, there is an abundance of research that these factors collide to create an unacceptably high risk of food insecurity and hunger. People should never go hungry, and hunger should never affect one's academic attainment. The risk for food insecurity is even greater among community colleges, where many lower-income, first-generation students of color begin their paths toward a degree. 
Food insecurity can drastically impact students' academic performance and lower grade point averages, poor class attendance, and lower graduation rates. That is, if they graduate at all. And sadly, we've seen that CUNY's graduation rates, particularly among its community colleges, are abysmal. Only 19.2% of students who enter associate degree programs at CUNY earn a degree in three years. If CUNY truly wishes to fulfill its mission of uplifting disadvantaged students, then it also has an obligation to help these students address food needs that have a real and lasting impact on their success. I want to acknowledge that CUNY has food pantries for needy students at all of its community colleges and at the majority of its senior colleges. CUNY also has a single stop program at all of its community colleges. For those of you who are unfamiliar with it, Single Stop is an essential program that provides campus-based assistance for students to access benefits such as food assistance through the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. Although only one of CUNY's senior colleges has a Single Stop program, in its draft 2019-2020 operating budget request and four-year financial plan, CUNY requested an additional $2.4 million to expand Single Stop to more senior colleges and an additional $7.8 million to develop a pilot program to provide swipe cards to be used at university cafeterias by needy students throughout the year. These are very important steps, but is it enough? I'm not referring to the financial asks, although that is certainly important, but is CUNY informing its students about the food resource it currently has? Do students know where to go for assistance? And what, if anything, is CUNY doing to help alleviate any stigma that may be attached to seeking assistance? We are also interested in obtaining a review, obtaining an overview of the relationship between HRA and local colleges and universities with regard to hunger. New York City is a quintessential college town, but the problem of food insecurity impacts students at many campuses across the city. Specifically, we are interested in learning about how the city is working to address the issue of hunger among college students who are in need of support, but who sadly may be overlooked. My hope is that at this hearing, we will all be listening to and learning about what more we can do to address this problem. Uh, we've acknowledged the members of the committee who are here. And I do want to also acknowledge Joy Simmons, my chief of staff, Indigo Washington, my C lia legislative liaison and CUNY legislative director and CUNY liaison, Chloe Rivera, the policy analyst, Paul Senegal, the council, and welcome Michelle Peregan, the committee's new financial analyst. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before we hear from the administration, uh, Councilmember Gradenchik wanted to make a brief opening remark as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Chair, for indulging me. Um, I, uh, I couldn't let this moment pass because uh, we did have a wonderful budget last year. And I got to this council just over three years ago, and one of the very first hearings that I went to was uh, the annual hearing on food insecurity. And I have to tell you in, in all frankness, I didn't know how much one meeting could change my life. Um, I was raised by two parents in public housing, um, and everybody who came had to eat something. Uh, I'm sure that uh, many of you had a similar experience with your parents, and my parents, if, if you didn't take food, they're like they, their day was ruined. So um, I learned from an early age that we everybody must be fed. And um, I just want to say in a few words, I want to say to the people who are here, thank you, because you've made a difference. And when people say that, you know, what, what does it matter? It does matter. It really matters. It matters because I have a chair in Steve Levin who really cares. We have a speaker in Corey Johnson who made this a top priority. It was the number one priority in the budget last year to end the budget dance on emergency food. We have members of this committee and really all 51 members of the council were on board. So it does matter. It does matter. I want to say that not just to the people in this room, but whoever may be watching this. It matters when you get up and you put your clothes on, you put your shoes on, and you come to hearings and make a difference. Um, as we have heard this morning, um, the fight's not over. 
We did manage to more than double the baseline for emergency food last year, but there are still over a million New Yorkers who are going hungry, and in this great city of ours, nobody, nobody should go hungry. We have the food, we have the logistics, we have the people willing to do the work, mostly volunteers, over 500 food pantries. We even manage with our emergency food to, f to feed furloughed federal workers, um, including members of the United States Coast Guard who had nothing to eat but were fed by food pantries in this city. Um, I want to say that I pledge myself um, that I will continue to legislate, to advocate, to gyrate, to do whatever I got to do uh, to make sure that no New Yorker goes hungry. Um, I want to say on a local note, because, you know, all politics are local, I'm happy to see my constituent here, the administrator of HRA, uh, Grace Bonilla. Uh, echoing the sentiments of uh, Chair Barron, I want to wish all who are celebrating a happy Valentine's Day. I tried that once, and uh, 27 years later, I'm still married, so it worked out. Um, and uh, I just want to say again, thank you. You've made a difference in the lives of many, many people who will never know who you are, um, who owe you their thanks, and they are having a better life because of the work that you've done. Thank you for indulging me, uh, Mr. Chairman and Madam Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Gudenchik, and thank you for all your advocacy. Um, uh, the Council to Committee, Aminta Kilowan, will swear you in. If you can all raise your right hands, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. You may begin. Okay. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman, uh, Madam Chair. We would like to start first with um, a video that really illustrates uh, the many steps that we are taking to make sure that we're making the message of using SNAP when needed accessible. Uh, so I, we will start with that before uh, we go into our testimony. Life can get busy. There's always somewhere you have to be or something you need to do. Whether it's an unexpected storm or a bus that pulls away as you get to the stop, one thing you can always count on is life is unpredictable. Which means when you're in a jam, you need some help to make your life simpler, not more complicated. Introducing the Access HRA website and mobile app. With these tools applying for and keeping track of your benefits, like SNAP, are, well, a SNAP. Using the Access HRA app, you can view the status of your SNAP case, get important notices about your case, and even view your SNAP EBT card balance, making planning your family's next meal a SNAP. Need to submit documents but don't have time to visit an HRA office? Let the Access HRA app help you. Using the camera on your mobile device, you can take pictures of your documents and upload them through the app. Making getting your information to us a snap. And if you do need to come into our offices, the Access HRA app makes getting information about your upcoming appointments a snap. The Access HRA website can help you do even more. There, you can apply for or recertify your SNAP benefits and check information about your case with just a few clicks. You can also recertify for cash assistance, submit your SNAP periodic report, and print a Medicaid renewal form. Soon, we'll be adding even more improvements to the Access HRA website and app to make applying for benefits and managing your case even easier. We know your benefits and your personal information are important to you, which is why we've built in state-of-the-art security to keep your information safe and secure. Our tools give you all the information you need to have peace of mind about your benefits. Download the Access HRA app or visit nyc.gov slash accesshra to get started today. Simple paperless, painless, and the easiest way to help manage your benefits. Well, thank you for indulging us. Uh, that video is uh, going far and wide in social media as well as being played in our centers uh, so that we can send the word out uh, that people don't necessarily have to come in to do business with HRA. Uh, and now I will turn to my testimony. 
Uh, good morning, Chairperson Levin, Chairperson Barron, and members of the General Welfare and Higher Education Committees. Thank you for the opportunity to testify and offer updates on our efforts to address food insecurity among New Yorkers and respond to questions you may have today. My name is Grace Bonilla. I am the Administrator of the New York City Human Resources Administration. I am joined today by Executive Deputy Commissioner Jill Berry and Chief Special Services Officer Annette Holm. HRA provides a variety of essential programs and supports to low-income New Yorkers, including various initiatives focused on reducing hunger and tackling underlying socioeconomic factors that lead to food insecurity. We work closely with agencies such as the Department of Aging, the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, the New York City Housing Authority, and the Mayor's Office of Food Policy to work towards a future where all New Yorkers have access to nutritious food. The ever-increasing cost of living is a major contributor to food insecurity. As housing, food, and transportation costs rise, it is increasingly more difficult for low-income New Yorkers to feed themselves and their families. Moreover, nutritious food is often more expensive and disproportionately concentrated in higher-income neighborhoods, creating even more obstacles for vulnerable New Yorkers to access quality food. Not only do these circumstances often result in hunger, but they can also have drastic effects on health and productivity. In children, food insecurity is linked to poor academic performance, low school attendance, and behavioral and physical health challenges. For adults, it is associated with poor health outcomes, particularly for the elderly, including premature mortality, depression, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic diseases. Too many New Yorkers are regularly forced to choose between paying rent or paying for groceries. At HRA, we work every day to disrupt the structural obstacles low-income New Yorkers face to live healthy lives. HRA's anti-poverty programs and initiatives include rental assistance, universal access to counsel, employment services, and more recently, fair fares, are meant to lessen the financial burden that low-income households face and alleviate the food insecurity they may be experiencing. Coupled with other initiatives, including the increase in the minimum wage recently reaching $15 for employers with more than 10 employees, and the recent enhancement to paid sick leave by allowing employees to use their paid leave if they're victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, or human trafficking, the goal is to continue lifting New Yorkers out of poverty and minimize hunger, poor health, and homelessness. Food insecurity results from insufficient funds to maintain a regular healthy diet. SNAP benefits are a central component in addressing food insecurity. Currently, 1.57 million New Yorkers receive SNAP, including 532 children and 300 and 532,000 children and 338,000 seniors aged 65 and over. Of these 1.57 million New Yorkers, 379,336 of them also receive cash assistance, an important safety net for children and adults. Many SNAP recipients work, but their wages are insufficient to handle modern day living expenses and, quality, and, and qualify them for benefits. And in addition to providing important dietary support, SNAP also generates business for local bodegas, farmers markets, and retailers, and can put individuals and families in a position where they can also purchase other essential items like baby products or medication. According to a report by the Citizens Budget Commission, 462,000 New York City renter households are severely rent burdened, paying more than 50% of their income on rent an unaffordable amount that drastically limits their ability to feed themselves well. To address this major driver of poverty and hunger, HRA offers rental assistance and emergency grants to keep families and individuals housed. We have successfully helped more than 104,000 New Yorkers move out of shelter into permanent housing or avert entry into shelter altogether. While we know there is more work that we need to do to address the challenges of housing insecurity that has built over years, this permanent housing assistance for these 104,000 children and adults shows the progress that we are making. In October of last year, we streamlined seven of the city rental assistance programs we administer into a single program called City FEPS. 
This challenge will reduce this change will reduce the need to check a client's eligibility for multiple programs, making it easier to see if clients qualify for assistance and ultimately make it much easier for clients, providers, and staff to navigate our rental assistance program. It also makes it easier for landlords to participate in the program and better align our programs with state and federal rental assistance programs. Eviction can drive people into poverty where they are more susceptible to struggle with hunger and poor health. New York City is committed to making legal services available to all tenants facing eviction in housing court and public housing authority termination of tenancy proceedings. The Universal Access to Counsel program has been extraordinary success, uh, an extraordinary success. Residential evictions by Marshalls declined by 37% since 2013 with approximately 18,000 evictions in 2018 compared nearly to 29,000 evictions in 2013. In 2018 alone, evictions decreased 14%, with 3,000 households more than, more than 8,000 New Yorkers across the five boroughs able to remain in their homes as a result. Since 2013, more than 100,000 New Yorkers who might have otherwise faced eviction have been able to stay in their homes. This decline in evictions follows a milestone in the administration's effort to combat homelessness and protect housing stability through its commitment to providing legal services for tenants facing, facing evictions and displacement. As of June 2018, the city has provided nearly a quarter million New Yorkers with legal representation, advice, or assistance in eviction and other housing-related matters through a tenant legal services program administered by HRA. The, the positive impact SNAP has for our city makes recent federal action that challenges our work in providing SNAP benefits to those in need all the more chilling in their, in their effect. Last year, the U.S. Office of Citizenship and Immigration Services, USCIS, issued a proposed rule, cha rule change to the definition of public charge by including more non-cash benefits, such as SNAP, in the proposal. As Commissioner Banks previously testified before the Immigration Committee, we're working with the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs to inform New Yorkers that this rule has not gone into effect and that our office is open for business and that there have been no changes to eligibility. Comments in opposition to the drastic proposed changes were submitted by the de Blasio administration, other elected officials, advocacy groups, and individuals highlighting the adverse impact on poverty levels and health in communities across the city. Most recently, we endured a 35-day federal shutdown, the longest federal government shutdown in history. Under the direction of the U.S. Department of Agriculture and working in concert with the New York State's Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, we processed pending applications and recertifications early and issued February benefits for most clients in January to ensure the issuance of benefits before the USDA determined that there were no longer they would no longer funds available to pay February benefits. We conducted a communications campaign to inform SNAP recipients of the unusual early issuance of February benefits so they could budget their food expenses appropriately and reassure them that nothing else about SNAP had changed due to the shutdown. We expanded our reach of this important news by notifying elected officials, community boards, CBOs, service delivery organizations, and city agencies to share or post this critical information. I want to take this opportunity to thank the HRA employees who successfully handled the coordination and distribution of the SNAP benefits in this unconventional circumstance so, so, to so many New Yorkers that are entitled to this assistance to feed their families. For March, OTDA has approved the distribution of SNAP benefits on a compressed schedule from March 1st to March 7th to limit the gap between the early February benefits and the March benefits. As of yesterday, we have initiated a communications campaign to inform New York City SNAP recipients and service providers of this important change. The shutdown also directed Impact, directly impacted 18,000 federal employees in New York City who were furloughed and did not receive a paycheck during the shutdown. These were New Yorkers who did not have an, who do not did not have anticipated income to pay for housing costs as well as food and other commodities. Understanding the gravity of the emergency they were facing, New York City set up a website so these employees knew what resources they could access. 
Additionally, many New York business ch churches, nonprofits stepped up and offered meals to federal employees impacted by the shutdown. Notwithstanding these challenges, HRA proceeds in its mandate to address food insecurity by increasing access to SNAP and helping these New Yorkers return those benefit, retain those benefits. As studies regularly conclude, Im improvements in the economy generally correlate to a reduction in the participation in, SNAP, in the SNAP program. Not surprisingly, as the local economy continues to improve, the SNAP participation rate in New York City declines. It decreased from 77% in 2013 to 72% in 2016 to 70% in 2017. In line with our prior testimony, we believe HRA's SNAP participation rate should not be compared to the state and national participation rates released by the federal government. The best metric for comparisons across geographic areas is the Program Access Index, PAI. Calculated by dividing the SNAP caseload by the number of people below 125% of the federal poverty line. Based on the PI metric, SNAP coverage is higher in New York City than it is in the country and in the rest of New York State. Specifically reported in 2017, the New York City PAI was 85%, compared to 73% in the U.S. and 81% in New York State overall. We have taken significant steps to ensure that all eligible New Yorkers have encumbered access, unencumbered access to HRA benefits and services. Our data show positive trends. Application rejections are down, and successful case recertifications are up. With 1.57 million New Yorkers are currently depending on timely and proper delivery of benefits, unburdened with bureaucratic barriers, HRA is devoted to continuously improve and streamlining the benefits delivery process. In May 2014, New York City accepted the state's ABOT waiver, which allowed able-bodied adults without children, also known as able-bodied adults without dependents, or ABODs, who are unemployed or underemployed to receive SNAP when they could not find at least 80 hours of work per month. Otherwise, they would be limited to receiving SNAP benefits for only three full months in any three-year period, unless they qualify for an exemption or, or are meeting work requirements. Such waivers are permitted for areas with high unemployment. ABOTs who live in the Bronx, Brooklyn, or Staten Island continue to have a waiver for 2019. In Manhattan, the strong economy means that areas below West 110th Street and below East 96th Street do not qualify for a waiver. The borough of Queens is also impacted by ABOT requirements, with the exception of residents of Community District 12 and, community, and effective January 1st, Community District 10. As I, as I previously mentioned, the Trump administration is using the regulatory process as an end run around the com uh, compromise reached by Congress in the reauthorization of the 2018 Farm Bill. The new rule would restrict waivers to areas where the unemployment rate is higher than 7% compared to the current unemployment rate, that, rate threshold of 10%. This attack on low-income single adults was, would exacerbate food insecurity, forcing many New Yorkers to lose their SNAP benefits by not meeting the proposed ABOD work requirement rules. In January of 2012, the council hearing was held to focus on long lines, overcrowding, and long wait times at HRA job centers and SNAP centers. And in 2014, this administration began to build on prior efforts to address this problem through investing in significant reforms to modernize our te technology systems, optimizing operational efficiencies, and improve the overall client experience. With federal and state approval by re removing real barriers to access and creating self-directed service model for clients, we are now able to permit SNAP applicants and clients to conduct a broad range of transactions with the agency without the burden of having to physically come to an HRA office. Thus far, we have, been re we have seen real results that reflect the change client experience at HRA SNAP centers. For example, the percent of SNAP applicants submitted online increased from 23% in 2013 to 87% in 2018, and the percent of SNAP application interviews conducted by phone increased from 29% in 2013 to 93% in 2018. As a result of SNAP in-center foot traffic, has declined 30 percent since 2014 because applications and recertifications can now be submitted online and eligibility interviews can be conducted by phone. 
At the core of our modernization effort is the Access HRA portal, an online tool that has remarkably improved the ways in which clients receive services. As of January 2019, there were more than 2 million Access HRA online accounts for SNAP food stamp households. We now receive over 20,000 online applications each month. Today, all SNAP eligibility interviews can be conducted at a client's convenience by phone, rather than the rigid four-hour window under the old system, or clients can choose to come into a center for an in-person interview. On-demand interviews for SNAP recertifications have been full, fully in place for more than two years, and as of September 2018, on-demand interviews for new SNAP applicants are available citywide. The portal allows clients to create an Access HRA account to gain access to over 100 case-specific points of information in real time, including application and case statuses, upcoming appointments, account balance, and documents requested for eligibility determination. Additionally, clients can make changes to contact, in contact information, view eligibility notice electronically, request a budget letter, and opt into text messages and email alerts. We continue to improve this tool to add new functionality, and now clients can submit their SNAP periodic report online using Access HRA. This new feature allows clients to report changes in household composition, income, and other circumstances. Another Another component of our modernization effort was to the rollout of the, access of the HRA mobile app, a self-service mobile app to give clients the ability to use their mobile device to better manage their cases by having immediate access to case details and the ability to submit required documents from their smartphones. Using Access HRA is now as user-friendly on a mobile device as it ha can be on a PC. This redesign will make transactions such as recertifying for SNAP even easier for clients who access the site from a mobile device because of the seamless integration between the Access HRA mobile app to the Access HRA client portal. Since the application's launch in March 2017, clients have uploaded nearly 4 million images and the app has scored a 4.6 App Store user rating. In addition, we've modernized our SNAP centers by providing on-site self-service. For clients who prefer to access our services inside one of our, our centers, we now have a suite of self-service tools, which include self-service check-in kiosk a PC and PC banks to utilize Access HRA and self-service scanning of documents. Overall, by providing an enhanced client experience in SNAP centers, these low-touch service models free up our eligibility workers' time so they can focus on those clients who need more support and assistance. These success in integrated technology improvements to modernize our SNAP systems are only one part of the equation. We're also actively continuing our efforts to enroll low-income New Yorkers by reaching out to New York City's universe of direct service providers to familiarize them with user-friendly features of Access HRA and develop partnerships with many sites that utilize the Access HRA provider portal, an online tool designed for CBOs to connect with the clients they serve. Through the Access HRA Provider Portal, organizations can view real-time benefit information for their clients and help them manage their cases, a service that reduces the possibility of benefits being lost due to a lapse in recertification, for example. Since the launch of the Provider Portal tool in September 2017, 230 organizations have signed up to utilize this tool. Our Office of Advocacy and Outreach provides Access HRA trainings for community-based organization staff who provide SNAP enrollment and case management services to their constituents. Specifically designed for CBO staff and caseworkers, these trainings provide an in-depth instruction in the use and benefits of Access HRA Client Portal, provider, uh, portal provider Portal and the mobile app. Since July 2017, the Office of Advocacy and Outreach has conducted 170 Access HRA trainings. In spite of HRA's technology improvements and progress in benefits reengineering, we recognize that many vulnerable New Yorkers are not receiving help and are susceptible to food insecurity. HRA's SNAP Support Service Unit dedicates itself to educating the public about SNAP benefits and eligibility guidelines. In addition, the staff pre-screens clients to determine eligibility and assists applicants with the application process. And 
fiscal year 18 SNAP support services provided services at 1,758 individual events at 380 individual community site locations and provided services at 132 sites on a recurrent basis. HRA also partnered with 117 community-based organizations to provide SNAP outreach throughout New York City. Among its many responsibilities, this group charged with ensuring that eligible, eligible immigrants and, and or qualified family members are enrolled in the SNAP program and receive SNAP benefits. This administration significantly expanded our outreach service to immigrants, as well as New Yorkers with low literacy and limited English proficiency by partnering with over 100 community-based human services and government agency organizations with proven track records of providing services to these groups. HRA has also outreach staff on site and readily available in housing developments and community sites, which include nine DIFTA senior centers that assist low re local residents with SNAP uh, prescreening and application help. The HRA outreach staff regularly attend resource fairs, farmers markets, and other community events, as well as speaking to inmates at Rikers and state and federal correctional facilities uh, about how to apply for SNAP. One of our most significant outreach efforts in the SNAP Help campaign that utilized a special website called foodhelp.nyc with mirroring sites in local law, local law languages, Spanish, Chinese, Russian, Korean, Haitian, Creole, and Arabic. The SNAP Help campaign encourages New Yorkers struggling to afford food, particularly low-income seniors and immigrants to seek help. In fiscal year 19, the HRA Emergency Food Assistance Program total funding for food and administrative expenses is uh, $20.2 million and includes $8.7 million in additional funding baseline by the administration at the time of adoption for fiscal year 19. This funding is being used to provide additional non-perishable and frozen food, provide additional administrative grants for non food related expenses and cover increased costs for warehousing and transportation. Food distribution to those in need remain our most important objective. In fiscal year 18, EFAB distributed more than 17.5 million pounds of food, including over 1.3 million pounds of frozen food. In the same period, EFAB program reported serving more than 13.6 million people. EFAP provides over 40 food items and, pr and purchases the most nutritious food items that also meet the dietary and cooking needs of special populations such as ho homeless New Yorkers, those with HIV AIDS, and those who need kosher or halal diet. In addition, many of these foods, food items are packaged differently. The actual purchase of these items is based on an anal analysis of the needs and trends of the emergency food network. We welcome the discussion on the uh, prevalence of food insecurity among college students, vulnerable populations normally overlooked. In a time where real wages are steadily declining and the cost of rent and food are increasing, increasingly rising, the additional burden of an expensive tuition makes it difficult for students to make ends meet. This difficulty is exacerbated for students coming from low-income families. Many college students find themselves food insecure and having to make the difficult decision between affording, affording food or other integral aspects of their college experience, such as textbooks or tuition. According to a study from the Urban Institute, 11% of students at our four-year institutions and 13% of community college students experience food insecurity. The severity of this issue is clear to see in New York City. Approximately 15% of students in the CUNY school system have reported going hungry because they lacked resources to buy food, and one quarter of students had to skip a meal because they could not afford food. The inability to have consistent healthy meals results in more than discomfort. It can lead to a higher predisposition to serious disease. It makes it difficult for students to concentrate during our, or complete their classes and can lead to higher levels of stress. To alleviate this serious issue, New York State launched an in in initiative for all SUNY and CUNY campuses to have a food pantry on site a great step in ensuring affordable access to healthy food for many college students. The Excelsior Scholarship Program launched in 2017 will also greatly assist many college students 
with the availability of free tuition for CUNY and SUNY schools. By eliminating this substantial subs, uh, expense for low and middle income families and individuals, students can pursue and aim to complete their college education and free up cash for purchase for purchase of food, medication, and other essential items. The city has also introduced several initiatives that make a variety of nutritious food widely available to everyone in the city and assist HRA in making SNAP a more effective and widely used program. One of these initiatives is New York City Green Card, which is a mobile food card program that offers fresh fruits and vegetables in neighborhoods with limited access to healthy food. While much has been done to make food more accessible and affordable to New Yorkers, including college students, there is much more that can, needs to be done. Much of the inability to utilize SNAP as a tool to end food insecurity for college students in New York City is due to SNAP being federally regulated. According to the federal rules dictated SNAP, dictating SNAP eligibility, most college students are not eligible for SNAP unless they work 20 hours per week or receive a federal work study grant. They may also be eligible if they take care of young children or they are in college as part of a workforce training program. HRA will continue to advocate for change to federal policies covering the eligibility rules by employment status that limit our ability to provide SNAP to vulnerable groups in need such as college students. SNAP and the Emergency Food Assistance Program, as well as other initiatives detailed in this testimony, will continue to provide necessary nutrition assistance to New Yorkers in need. But more remains to be done to ensure that New Yorkers, New Yorker go, a New, no New Yorker goes hungry as a result of an inability to afford and purchase food. We are proud of our work to expand access and remove barriers to these essential benefits and services. For clients, it has resulted in a shorter wait time and a better client experience. We're also working to protect, protect against any proposed federal cut that threatens the SNAP program or the nation's other safety net programs, as well as policies that may harm our immigrant communities. Not only would cuts to SNAP be devastating to those New Yorkers who rely on this crucial benefit, they would also harm the local economy. We look forward to continued co continue collaboration as we work with this council and advocates to protect the enormous gains we have made in recent years under the de Blasio administration and to fight back against any proposed budget cuts or policies and regulations that harm low-income New Yorkers. Uh, we welcome your questions. Thank you. I uh, want to thank you for your testimony. It was quite comprehensive, and we thank you for that. I do want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Ayala, Council Member Reynosa, and Council Member Bradlander. Thank you for your testimony. Um, now, in the portion of your testimony where you talk about the impact or the requirements that uh, students work at least 20 hours in order to, or receive a federal work study grant in order to be eligible, do we have an idea of how many students are actually receiving uh, SNAP? Do we have that number? Can we get the number? Do we know that? Um, I, do we have that? We don't have that number today. I can, uh, we can absolutely make that available to you after the hearing. Okay. And certainly we understand that if students are working 20 hours a week, that certainly has a negative impact on their being able to take a full load of, although there are many students who do that, and we may hear from them here today, but it certainly has an impact on their ability to take classes as well as an impact on their grade point average, which you talked about. Um, earlier. In general, you talked about the portal, the Access HRA tool. Can you tell us quantitatively how that system has uh, reduced the time for an application to be processed from what it was previously? So the uh we, we have seen a reduction in the time that it takes to process applications, mainly because uh, we are able to get documents much faster from clients who before would go back and forth with us on whether they handed documents or not. Uh, but do we have a, a number on that? How long did it take previously as compared to the average length of time that it takes now that you have this tool? We're required to process all applications within 30 days, and, and we are meeting the 30-day time frame. But you don't have a definitive number as to how 
Hammocks. No, part of that is to allow the client sufficient time to return documents to us and for us to ensure that they have to communicate back to clients when they haven't submitted sufficient documents. So that 30 day period gives them the full time. So it's still 30 days. And my question is I'm trying to figure, I'm trying to get an idea of how much less time it is that now now that you have the online tool is it now 28 days rather than the full 30 or do you just wait the 30 days regardless to close the case out i'm trying to get a quantitative definitive answer. so uh council member one of the things that uh has been great about access hra is that we really have worked to uh streamline the front end of the app uh, we are still, as part of the modernization, working on uh, modernizing the back end of how we process cases. Uh, so that is still a work in progress. Okay. And once we are able to fully modernize the front end and back end, we, that's when we will start seeing the results of uh, those days going down. Okay. And I had a question which uh, you perhaps gave some information on. I had previously asked about the uh, able-bodied uh, adults without dependents. And my question was, and I think it's part of your testimony, that it does apply to those who live in Brooklyn because at some point I had seen that it didn't, didn't right, say Brooklyn. So Brooklyn is part of, currently, uh, part of the city that is able to take advantage of this waiver. Um, there are other parts, like I said in my testimony, in, in Queens and Manhattan where we don't have that luxury. Is it a requirement of someone to uh, make an application to be included, or is it just done automatically? It, it's automatic dep dependent on where you live. As long as you live in, in Brooklyn, you are not subject to ABOD requirements. You are waived. So it doesn't d require community or zip code or anything, just as long as you live in Brooklyn? Correct. Anyone in Brooklyn? Okay, okay, good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Chair Barron. Um, so uh, is anyone from CUNY wishing to, to testify or is? I believe that's the next panel. Oh, the next, okay, and a separate panel, okay. Um, so uh, I wanted to just uh, maybe follow up a little bit on Councilor Barron's questions around um, around uh, uh, Access HRA. Um, so the number of the, 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 um, the percentage, uh, the one, one metric that struck me in your testimony was the, the number or percentage of um, cases that were, have been submitted online going up from 23% to 87% in five years, uh, which is remarkable. Was there, was there, now the ones that were done before, how were they done? Was, was it, Prior to access HRA was did you know you guys created it right? Right, we did create it. Uh, so this process has been really a five-year process. It's not a flipping of the switch, right? So I believe that when we were before you last year, we were still uh, finalizing moving all of the city into app being able to apply on demand. Mm -hmm. if that if I have the timing correct, right? So as we have phased in. Uh, this uh, approach of being able to do things on demand, we have seen an increase of folks really taking advantage of it. So that's what really led to the spike. 2018 was really when we focused in ensuring that the rest of the city, borough by borough, was able to not just recertify uh, through the uh, through the app, but also apply. Um, has there been a um, correlating increase in our PAI, uh, the, the Program Access Index? That's a great um, question. Uh, we know that we are definitely hitting more neighborhoods uh, than we did before. I don't know if today we can make the correlation between the number of people using the app and the, the very good number. yeah PAI number that we do have. Excuse me. <coughs> are there any other, you know, I mean, you mentioned um, New York State as a whole and the United States as a whole. Are there any other uh, jurisdictions that, I mean, are we the highest at 85 percent or are there other jurisdictions that, that achieve higher numbers? Uh, I don't have that number currently, but I know that uh, we are a leader nationally uh, in the way that we accept SNAP applications. Uh, I believe about a year or so ago, we were also asked to uh, testify in Congress about our efforts. So I know that nationally we are a leader in the space. Did you need special approvals from OTDA or uh, USDA to 
to configure Access HRA that, the way you wished? And Ab so how, what were those ways? Absolutely. Uh, we, as, as you all know, SNAP is a benefit that is administered by the federal government um, through OTDA. So the partnership with OTDA and the federal government at the time that we applied for the waivers was critical to move us in this direction. Okay. Um, and uh, specifically, what kind of waivers did you did you request? So for, uh, for example, uh, one of the things that was uh, a requirement of applying for SNAP is that you also had to do a face-to-face -face in SNAP, right? Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you go back uh, five years ago, one of the waivers we received was the ability to have uh, that appointment uh, over the phone which uh, opened up the possibility of creating what we have, what we call now tip centers. So now people can call at their convenience to verify the information that's handed in. So if somebody is able to use the app and is proficient to use the app um, and uh, that it works out properly to have an on-demand interview on the phone, does, does every, is there an instance where someone does not have to come in at all uh, that person facing. should not have to come in at all. Not once. Not once. Um, uh, and yet, there are still people that come in. So wh why do we, why are people still deciding to come in? Sure. So uh, for what the, drives that decision? Yeah, for the most part, um, it's it's multi pronged. One of the reasons that people come in is because they still want to see someone face to face and have the conversation, right? That's mm -hmm. and and we see that uh, in sometimes the folks who are uh, English limited or are older adults who just don't trust these devices, right? And mm -hmm. and that's why we're still there. Um, the other piece of it is that we really have to make sure that everyone knows about the app. We've had instances where our um, staff will go out into the waiting room to just sur uh, survey the, the waiting room to see why people are there, and sometimes someone will say, oh, I just want to hand in this document, and they're like, well, did you know? And, and they're there really to help them download the app, it's like, did you know that you could do this? And then people are like, I had no idea, and they'll leave or hand, hand it in, and, but not come back the next time. So the reasons vary. It's one of the, uh, but that particular reason, not knowing, uh, has come up over and over and over again, which is why we're launching a campaign in March to really just drive the point home that not just SNAP recipients, but also someone who's already on cash assistance can open up an Access HRA account, upload documents, and reduce the number of visits they have to make to an HRA location. Right, because the, cause the, the, you said the, the number of visits has gone down 30%. But the increase in the number of people using uh, using the app, using SSHRA has no, sorry, using Access HRA has gone up so significantly. So, yep. so the, 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 from twenty seven to eighty some odd percent. So that's correct. Um, that's so. So we're seeing this huge increase, but but uh, you know a slightly you know or a smaller decrease in the number of, of in the amount of foot traffic. And so I'm wondering, kind of. Um, uh, how many how many downloads of the app are there? That's a great question. I don't know that we we don't have that readily available. Okay, we should we should find out. Absolutely. Um, I mean, and how long? It's only been up for less than a year, right? The app. No, the app has been around for a couple of years. Okay. Uh, we have made improvements to the mobile upload that have has made it more attractive. Um, so that we've seen an increase in uh, utilization on, on that side. Um, but there are two million Access HRA online accounts, mm -hmm. so that exceeds That's the number of, of that exceeds the number of SNAP recipients and TA recipients combined. So correct. What drives that is that, as you can imagine, for all of us who have online accounts everywhere, uh -huh. you forget your password. Mm -hmm. uh, you there are a number of reasons why you would have uh, someone have more than one account. Does that create any you know logistical backlogs for HRA? Not really. Uh, on the back end, we have access to their uh, to their information, regardless mm -hmm. of what the front end looks like. So we don't have that problem, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's really making sure that people have access uh, to their documents. Uh, so that's another conversation that we constantly have to make sure that they're um, they, they're leaving their password in a place that's accessible. Um, what's what right now does does the team that built that? And I just want to give uh, you know. Kudos to the team that, that built this out because I know that they worked very hard on that. Mm -hmm. um, by the way, I encourage that you do the demonstration 
for Access HRA. So I encourage everybody that works at a not-for-profit or an elected official's office uh, to go and do the demonstration on Fridays in Brooklyn. Is that that's right? That's right. We'll do it. That's right. We have a specific date. Uh, please contact us. We are eagerly wanting to make sure that people are not just using Access HRA, but for CBOs, the provider portal right. is also uh, a huge asset to your case management um, methodology. Um, what are the kind of challenges right now that you're looking at with Access HRA in terms of how to make it better, more effective, uh, reach more people, or iron out any kinks that are there right now? Well, so more recently, I, I could give you one from the past that we've been able to fix. More recently, one of the uh, criticisms was the clarity of documents when people were uploading them. We were able to make sure that we fixed that really very quickly in, in the, one of the latest releases that we had. Jill, do you have anything that we've been working on that you want to point to? Sure. Some of the, the things we did very recently was to make it um, more mobile friendly so that it is easier to use the app on a mobile device. Um, we also re released the, um, the application and it made it easier to, specifically in our centers, toggle back and forth um, between English and other languages. Mm -hmm. So it's easier for our staff to assist clients who are coming into our centers, who are limited English, may not be comfortable using at home, but we're able to help them navigate it in the center by being able to toggle back and forth between the two languages. So hopefully they'll then be more comfortable using the app at home in the future. Um, how has this affected your workforce, by the way, your SNAP workforce? Because I, I know that um, uh, the center on DeKalb Avenue is closed. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, the staff has been relocated. So how has how, how is this impacted staff? So uh, the impact on staff is that we really, from a front-end perspective, can really focus in on um, the, the cohort of clients that are never going to use the app, right, and have critical needs. So that has been a plus from a frontline perspective and a, from a front-facing perspective. On the back end, like I said, we are, this is something that is iterative and it's evolving, uh, and we're still working on making sure that the experience for the staff on the back end is as seamless as possible. Um, the, but I do want to clarify, the closing of DCALB was uh, because we lost the lease, uh, but it also provided us an incredible opportunity. When we saw the decrease of foot traffic, uh, it really provided an opportunity for us to uh, bring staff together and address other workload issues that may not be addressed with staff in uh, multiple centers. And then my last question on access. HRA, is there, is there, um, are you looking at expanding um, provisions of access HRA to cash assistance? Um, I mean, I imagine that you might need some federal waivers for that and, you know, we'll see that So I, I just really want to drive this point home and I'm hoping our campaign in March can help us do that in a more articulate way that I could do it today. If you are a cash client, you can have an Access HRA account, right? You can still upload your documents. You can see what your balances are. You can see what notices are coming in. Um, where the limitations are on the cash side, and you're absolutely right, council member, we would need waivers, is that you still have to come in to do a face-to-face, -face, right? So Fingerprinting. I'm sorry? F fingerprinting as well. Yes, that you still have to come in to do that. And mm -hmm. because cash is a state and federally managed program that we administer, we do absolutely need the support of our state and federal partners to remove those barriers so that our cash clients don't have to come in. Because if we could see the percentage of cash recipients using online go from whatever percentage to 87%, that would be... That would be amazing. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, I'm going to... Just move over quickly here to um, uh, some EFAP questions or kind of uh, you know broader pantry questions. Um, so there's the uh, New York City Food Assistance Collaborative mm -hmm. has we, it was a partnership formed in 2015. HRA, Char uh, Helmsley Charitable Trust, Redstone Strategy Group, New York State HIPNAP, uh, and the Director of Food Policy in the Mayor's Office and key, key emergency food providers. Um, how? is that going and um, uh, how is that how is that partnership uh, or that collaborative um, uh, what, is, what what are the outcomes of that in terms of uh, increasing capacity and particularly in, in uh, underserved neighborhoods mm -hmm. that have been there were six I identified uh, mm -hmm. neighborhoods that uh, that were uh, seen as being uh, 
having the potential to be increased in terms of access to food. So we were really fortunate to have that partnership take place uh, almost at the synergy of that partnership prior to being able to increase the baseline on EFAP really informed what we could do with the additional funds. So you're absolutely right. Through that partnership, we were able to identify food deserts. Um, one of the things that came out of it, for example, was that even though there was a food desert, there wasn't an appropriate brick and mortar order in certain neighborhoods so that we could create a, a SNAP, uh, I'm sorry, an EFAP location or pantry location. It's what led to uh, the mobile uh, pantry system that I, I was I was lucky enough to see in Staten Island, mm -hmm. uh, where it's a predictable time. Trucks are coming in with uh, goods and commodities, and and folks understand that that's a time they can get food. Uh, so that's one of the things that we were able to discover through the collaborative. Uh, the other uh, portion of, of the collaborative was really in other food deserts where there was brick and mortar. It gave us an opportunity to have the conversation of, well, how do we increase pantries and soup kitchens in particular neighborhoods? Um, the um, Another thing that I don't want to fail to mention is the Plentiful app, right? The Plentiful app that came out of that partnership has made, has made it possible uh, for folks that do utilize pantries to do it in a dignified way. They can, like, very much like access at HRA, they can have an account. Uh, they can put in their order before going into a pantry uh, for, the, for the pantries that you do use the uh, Plentiful app, and they can come and pick up their food. Uh, so it's been a, co a collaboration that's really elucidated for us all the, uh, the different ways that we can get creative with the funds that we have and neighborhoods that we really need to focus on. And that on. could be for HIPNAP and EFAP and it kind of, it, it, in terms of what's on, on the Plentiful app, in, it's, it's, selecting your food is, is, is a, it could be the, the range of sources? I believe that's right. Yeah, I believe that. We can, we can uh, confirm. And our, how, uh, what, what percentage of our pantry network is, is using, or EFAP network, pantries that participate in EFAP are using the Plentiful app? That's a great question. I would have to get back to you on that, but I do want to point out that uh, since that collaboration and the additional investment, we were able to increase by 43 new pantries uh, and 51 um, in increased access. And uh, 51 in uh, 51 uh, have increased their allocation okay. because of the investment made by the city with the support of the, of the council. Is the collaborative still still going? Um, it's uh, their work will come to a close at I believe at, at the uh, beginning of June and I do have a number 232 pantries are now using plentiful okay out of how many in the network do you know so in the EFAP network we have 558 okay. pantries uh, that doesn't account for pantries that receive funding on their own so right. I, I could tell you what we have in the EFAP network right right so yeah. about half of the is that, is that right so half of the are all the 200 yeah. or so that are using it EFAP providers? Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. Yeah. Um, okay, but if it's any, if it's around half, that's a decent start. And obviously, I mean, it would be interesting to know from them, those that don't aren't using it, why they're not using it. If it's a, if it's a, if it's a good resource for a pantry, you know, everyone yeah. should probably. That is want something to use we it. could absolutely look into. Yeah. I think the general response is that when a pantry is managed mainly by volunteers, mm -hmm. uh, it's it's more challenging to maintain that type of system. Um, and then, I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Uh, uh, but I have one more question about um, uh, EFAP. Is there, how how is the uh, increase in allocation working or the you know the increase in funds baselined working at EFAP because I, I did hear from one provider and I'm paraphrasing this person mm -hmm. who said that um, it's great because we're seeing uh, this this increase but as a result now we're relying even more on EFAP right um, this is, uh, you know, pantries are because it, it now makes up a greater percentage mm -hmm. of their overall food. Um, and there's, I think, some concerns about kind of the timeliness of the food getting there. And so how are we measuring that and, and ensuring that pantries are getting the EFAP provisions in a timely way? 
that's a great question. Uh, I, I want to preface my response by saying that every single pantry has a contact at, within our EFAP program uh, where they can get in touch with us if they have any challenges with food, supply, anything. Um, and in anticipation of this question, I asked the team if we have received any complaints on timeliness, and we haven't. So the, what, what are the challenges of the food world, emergency food world, is that uh, the funding comes from a number of places, right? So we have been tracking, as you can imagine, with this new investment, uh, the rate at which we are meeting our delivery timelines. And I'm happy to report we have met our delivery timelines. However, if a pantry is receiving food that is funded through the state or federal government, while they're receiving that food or not receiving that food, they don't know where the funding is coming from, right? Mm -hmm. um, and because of the incredible uh, investment that this city has made, I think it, we automatically go to EFAP as the challenge, um, but we have not seen that. Okay, thank you. I'll turn it over to my colleagues for questions. Uh, Councilmember. Sorry, Councilmember Adams. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Madam Chair, for this important hearing today, and welcome. Good to see you all again. Uh, I remember sitting here last year going over some of the same things that we're going over, only we've increased it since then, so um, we're really, really happy to do that. I am really thrilled about the app. I think that it's going to take you very, very far, and I know that a lot of people are going to be helped and a lot of relief is going to happen because of the use of the app. So we'll do our part to help spread the word to get this information out um, to folks particularly that have been waiting uh, on phones and everything else to get some information. I just think this app is, is A number one, thank so you. thank you for that. Also really happy to hear about the Plentiful app. Uh, that's something that we've got to spread the word on uh, also, and I was going to ask the same question that my colleague asked as far as the breadth of the Plentiful app and why it would or would not be utilized more often. And that answer made a lot of sense to me in the fact that there are so many volunteers out there um, that it would really stress them. I know particularly in my districts it would really stress them even though I would love to have them on board with this app as well. So that said, I really just have one question, and it's just for, for clarity on my part, so if you'll just indulge me. Uh, along the lines of what Councilmember Barron was asking about the ABOD waiver, uh, for I, I noticed the information uh, impacts uh, my district 28 because it references the community boards uh, 10 and 12 in Queens. So if you could just clarify for me whether or not the waiver itself uh, impacts more who don't qualify or more who do qualify for the waiver, just so that I can understand. It says there's an exemption uh, with the exception of residents in Community Board District 12 and Community Board District 10. The exception would be for more uh, folks to be on the waiver or more folks to be exempt from the waiver? Do you understand? Those who live in Queens and are not in those two community districts are not eligible for the waiver. Okay. So they are subject to the ABOD requirements. All right, that's, that's what I thought. All right, I just wanted to, to have a clarity in my mind. That is my final question, thank you. I just want to say that we've been uh, joined by Councilmember Mark Joni from the Bronx. Uh, and we'll turn it over to Councilmember Joni for questions. Thank you, Chairs, and uh, let me just begin by wishing everyone a happy Valentine's Day. Uh, it's remarkable to see that 34% of our food pantries and uh, kitchens are forced to turn people away or cut the hours of operation as well as the portions of food that they're giving out. Something that I've been working on for a number of years and I'm hopeful that you'll not only embrace but be a bit supportive of is the amount of woo food that gets thrown out on a daily basis from our large catering halls. This is perfectly good food edible. Uh, most of us dine out. We take home our leftovers. It's perfectly fine. The liability associated with that food being turned over to a mm -hmm. kitchen. Uh, many of our restaurateurs are unwilling to subject themselves to that liability for various reasons. Um, and it's just shameful to think that people go into bed hungry. And on the other hand, so much food is being discarded. Uh, I have a large number of these catering halls mm -hmm. in my district. I've communicated to them, and we're going to start a pilot program that I really need your help on. Um, 
we just have to create the vessel and the vehicle by which we relieve the liability from those restaurateurs. Mm -hmm. And whether it be an NGO, a non-for-profit, or directly with the food pantry, um, I've allocated some of my own discretionary funding toward a truck that would keep this food refrigerated from point A to point B. Uh, this way it can be served. Uh, just your thoughts on this matter. Absolutely, and I, I can uh, sympathize with uh, the sentiment. Um, we are very lucky in the city to have a city harvest. Uh, city Harvest is one of the, uh, the largest providers of food, and what their business is is exactly what you're talking about, food rescue. Uh, so they take food that are from that would otherwise go to waste and uh, provide it to pantries that have the capacity to distribute it. I'm happy to have a conversation with you after the hearing to see what we can do to assist. In that regard, does City Harvest accept the liability associated with the transporting of the food? That's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer for that. We'd probably have to talk to some other of our city's uh, sister agencies uh, mm -hmm. to figure that piece out. And as far as you know, are they offering any type of uh, credit to these restaurants that participate? Again, another question that would be best served if we could have it offline with City Harvest. That would be great. Yeah, Thank happy, you. To, happy to uh, support. And, I, and they may even be in the room if they're here. City Harvest here? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, so, uh, I think we have. Yeah. Sorry, we'll, 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 yeah, so. You can talk offline. And then. Or when you testify. Um, uh, okay, do, do any other council members have questions? Bob, do you have questions? Council Member Robert Holden. Yes, uh, thank you, and thank you for your great testimony. It's very encouraging to, uh, to hear this. Uh, the, uh, you said that, I just have one question. You, you said that you're launching the campaign Access HRA for the app in March. That's correct. That's correct. Um, how do you plan to reach your target audience? Uh, uh, so it's, a, uh, it's uh, basically a PSI, right? We are going to be involved in social media, uh, we are using, um, and if, correct me if I'm wrong, anyone in the room, subway uh, ads, um, where print, social media, and transportation hubs is how we're hoping to do this. Yeah, bus uh, shelters in, in, in target neighborhoods. Where, absolutely. That's absolutely. great. Yeah. Uh, it, it's very much what we did when uh, the shutdown was, was happening. We depend very much on our CBOs. We're going to get the word out. Uh, we're definitely making a larger investment in March. Uh, by using transportation hubs, and social media, and print uh, yeah, media. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure the city council can help um, get the message out, like, like other council members have mentioned, putting it in our newsletters. Uh, and but I, but I think it's so important on bus shelters, especially where right. people in those neighborhoods can actually see it very large and and uh, access the uh, the app, which sounds terrific. Thank you and very much. And just to Thanks. clarify my answer, we will also uh, we will have digital print, outdoor, and radio uh, media in, mul in multiple languages. Terrific. Thank you very much. Councilmember Ayala. Sorry, Councilmember Ayala. It's throwing out. It's freezing in here. So sorry, guys. I swear. You can't make it up. But I have a question, I have a, just out of curiosity, because we've been having some public charge uh, info sessions throughout the district, and I wonder, has there been any impact since the president announced uh, potential changes to the rule? So we have not seen, um, and just to go back, we saw the public charge proposed rule come out in October. Uh, there was a, pe uh, a period for um, comments. Uh, the de Blasio administration, HRA, DOH, I mean, all of us, I think, were involved in having info sessions in a number of communities. Uh, since the deadline of the uh, comments were put in, and I believe there are like thousands and thousands of comments, so there's an obligation on the federal side to review those comments. We have not heard anything from the federal government, so it's critically important that I, I just uh, underscore nothing has changed. Uh, eligibility requirements haven't changed. We have not seen any updates on this, so people should feel free to come and use. We haven't seen a decrease either in, in enrollment or people that have disenrolled because they're afraid. We have not seen a de decrease okay. for that particular reason. Okay. Uh, like I said in my testimony, the, uh, the we can uh, we can very clearly attribute de uh, decrease to the. Uh, improvement of the economy, but not for this reason. Understood. And then the able-bodied, my final question is about the able-bodied requirement. So I'm always afraid that certain individuals kind of get left behind, right? I think my district, uh, Zip Code 1035, actually has the exception. But um, I'm always concerned about individuals with 
uh, severe mental illness, right? That wouldn't necessarily are not connected. So, for instance, I'll give you a case. My, I have, I have a, an individual in my family who suffers from mental illness and doesn't he hasn't been able to access services because he's an adult so thereby he's responsible for accessing these services on his own but he wouldn't necessarily know how to navigate them because he's mentally ill mm. if he applied because he does however get hungry and i'm sure will apply for food stamps because that's something that's kind of instinct instinctive um he would probably be considered uh ineligible because he's an able-bodied young adult is there like a way to kind of capture when a person, when an individual is suffering from, you know, uh, some sort of mental uh, disability? Yeah, anybody who suffers from any physical or mental disability is not actually considered an ABOD. They are excluded from ABOD requirements. And that doesn't even count against the limited exemptions that we get from the federal government. They're not considered able-bodied for this purpose. But if he's not receiving Social Security or, or SSI or uh, disability benefits, but has been institutionalized, and I'm just saying in, in this case, I'm using him as an example, but an, an individual that has been in and out of the hospital, um, how do you capture that, right? Because you have to prove it. Well, so thankfully, the federal government um, does not actually require there to be documentation of this. It's sufficient for an eligibility worker to observe that a person is physically or mentally disabled or for a client to disclose that to us, and that is sufficient documentation. How do you do that when we're seeing more and more clients apply electronically? Right, so, and that is absolutely a challenge. Um, we do send uh, an outreach letter to every single person who is coded as an ABOD, so those we might not realize have a mental or physical disability, um, every single month. We encourage them to come into our vendors' locations. Who they can either assist somebody with getting employment, or they can take the documentation or make an observation of those who are not physically or mentally able to work and code that exclusion on that person. But I also want to just uh, uh, preface that we do have other services at HRA, right? Uh, if someone needs to apply and they cannot come in, uh, we will ha send someone out to take that application. If someone is unable to take care of themselves, we have adult protective services. So uh, the the beauty of having all of these resources within one agency is that our executive deputy commissioners, our deputy commissioners, our staff work together to address those needs when they're brought to our attention. Understood. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Mariala. Um, uh, I just want to ask a little bit about um, the uh, uh, the proposed rule on um, the, uh, on uh, the proposed rule from this fall on um, uh, I'm blanking on the, the terminology the um, on. Uh, Public charge. Um, can you can you share with us what uh, what the status is? Um, have you heard anything from the federal government about um, whether they're going to move forward on implementation of this or how they're considering the public comments? Sure. We are tracking this incredibly closely. Um, as you know, council member, this was uh, an effort that in included multiple cities across the country to make sure that we sent in as many comments as possible. Uh, since the submission of the comments, we have not heard anything from the federal government one way or the other, but we are, we are tracking this. No indication as to when they will be trying going towards making a decision, whether it will be a reopening of the conversation or how they're looking to, um, it, maybe you can speak a little bit to the process of, of um, uh, what is, do you know how the process would move forward kind of as of, as of course from this point in terms of they've received comments, then they, then they might incorporate those comments into a new proposed rule. Does that open up for another set of comments or is, or is the comment period uh, just at one time? My understanding is that they have a, uh, an obligation to review all the comments. Uh, the more nuanced the comments, the longer they, they're going to take to review them. Mm -hmm. uh, they may or may not incorporate those comments into uh, their final rule. Uh, they will publish the final rule when, when they decide, and I believe it's 60 days after the publication, it will become final. Uh, and, and does Congress have any um, say in, in, in a rule like this, this is ex uh, exclusively uh, an executive um, 
an agency decision or is this there? is exclusively an executive agency decision very much like OTDA may put a regulation together uh, mm -hmm. and it wouldn't go to the assembly or the state senate um, it's, it's a it, it's an interpretation of an existing statute so it's very much in the executive branch is New York City uh, examining whether to um, file for an injunction if the rule were to go forward? Uh, these are conversations that we are actively happening uh, to see what our, um, our recourse would be. Uh, it's larger than the city. Uh, we're, like mm -hmm. I said, we're talking to partners across the country uh, to strategize uh, in ways that we can just push this back and have it not happen in the city. An HRA's message, have you seen an impact on enrollment to SNAP um, I, because of this? So now that we have um, four or five months of data? Uh, we have not seen a direct correlation uh, in our immigrant population uh, with the public charge and enrollment. Okay. Um, do you get a lot of inquiries from communities? It depends on when it makes it into the press. <laughs> if it makes it to the press, we will get more inquiries. Okay. Um, and, but we are, our, our message has been consistent. Uh, we are open for business. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so that message has gotten, gotten out there. Um, that said, uh, if this does move forward, it could have potentially devastating effects. As Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any further questions? Okay. Thank, thank you, you very much. So uh, we will now hear from representatives from CUNY. The next panel will be Vice Chancellor Chris Rosa from CUNY, Ms. Deborah Hart from BMCC Food Pantry of CUNY, and Dr. Charles Platkin from Hunter Food Policy Institute. You want to give him some assistance making some space? Move the table so he can get through it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask the council to administer the uh, oath. Could you all please raise your right hand? Oh. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Barron, Chair Levin. Honorable members of the Higher Education and General Welfare Committees, I'd like to begin my testimony today by thanking you for your ongoing support of the City University of New York and for your enduring commitment to the health, wellness, safety, and academic success of CUNY students. My name is Chris Rosa and I proudly serve as CUNY's Interim Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs. I'd like to introduce my colleagues. I'm joined today by Deborah Hart, the founding director of Single Stop at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, who will provide detailed information about Single Stop's contribution to eliminating food insecurity at CUNY. Sitting next to Deborah is Dr. Charles Platkin, executive director of the Hunter College uh, New York City Food Policy Center, who will speak about the impact of food insecurity on hunger and academic performance and success. He will also identify strategies to address this issue. 
Also joining us for the question and answer portion uh, are my colleagues from the Central Office of Student Affairs at CUNY, uh, Lori Beck and Shirley DePena, uh, who are content experts in our efforts to address food insecurity at CUNY. As you all know, all students attending a New York City Department of Education school are eligible to receive breakfast and lunch at no cost. Then, upon entering CUNY, students must pay in full for their meals. Almost 80% of CUNY's first-time freshmen come from the New York City Department of Education, and 42% of all first-time freshmen come from households with annual incomes of $20,000 or less. Purchasing meals can be a hardship for many students. And may I add that presently, these students lose uh, free transportation when they move from New York City public schools uh, to CUNY and bear the additional cost of Metro cards. And we are very hopeful that the Fair Fares program will lessen the burden for many CUNY students. Research conducted by Healthy CUNY and the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute found that 15% of CUNY undergraduates under the age of 30 or approximately 36,000 CUNY students reported that they had gone hungry often or sometimes in the past 12 months. Researchers also found that food insecure students had, on average, lower GPAs than food secure students and were 16% more likely than their food secure peers to take a leave of absence. In 2018, Governor Cuomo's State of the State Address included the No Student Goes Hungry proposal that contained five elements, including a requirement that all CUNY and SUNY schools have food pantries and or a food voucher program. Furthermore, in late August 2018, Governor Cuomo announced 100% of New York State public colleges at SUNY and CUNY will have a food pantry or stigma fee of free food access for students in need by the end of the fall semester. Consistent with the intent of the governor's proposals, CUNY has implemented programs and services in the effort to make sure that no CUNY student goes hungry. We know that it is in the best interest of all our food insecure students to have access to nutritious, healthy food. All 18 undergraduate institutions have at least a food pantry or on-campus food voucher program, and many have both. Additionally, several colleges have adopted grab-and-go takeaway bags containing non-perishable nutritious food items that can be consumed at school or at home. A few community colleges provide students access to enough food to feed themselves and their families. For example, LaGuardia Community College serves students Monday through Friday on a walk-in basis. Food items are student-selected and dispersed in quantities that accommodate an individual or family for seven days uh, at three meals per day. Lehman College features the Dining Dollars Initiative. Students who are identified through an application process are provided with a financial allocation that is added to their student ID account. Each student awarded is provided dining dollars that can be utilized at on-campus facilities. John Jay College for Criminal Justice implemented the Comfort Station, which provides nutritious breakfast, lunch, and snack items, including sandwiches, bagels, cream cheese, eggs, oatmeal, mac and cheese, and soups to accommodate students' busy schedules. At CUNY's smaller schools, its graduate and professional schools, as well as the School of Professional Studies, at which most students are online students, where a pantry is not feasible, there must be at least one staff member who is responsible for assisting students who are food insecure. The colleges are obligated to make sure students know who these staff members are. A few colleges are facing serious space constraints, which have made establishing pantries very difficult. All of these colleges, however, have come up with other innovative workaround solutions, including on-campus food vouchers and grab-and-go takeaway bags. More than 10 of our colleges work closely with the Food Bank of New York City, and this is a partnership we greatly encourage. There are many advantages to working with the Food Bank, including nutritional guidance, technical support, healthy food at a reduced price, and delivery to the campus. A few campuses have relationships with local supermarkets that donate gift cards over the holidays especially. Some colleges are working with Grow NYC to provide students with fresh food boxes. The boxes are delivered to the campus where students can pick them up. Food boxes cost $14 per box, 
but with a generous grant from the Carol and Milton Petrie Foundation, CUNY students are able to receive the fresh food boxes at no cost. In regard to outreach, while some colleges are doing a better job than others, all take outreach very seriously and understand that this is critical, uh, a critical component to addressing food insecurity in a meaningful way. We find that colleges with newer pantries have more of a challenge, as students must be educated about the resource. Several of our campuses are doing a superb job uh, in regard to outreach and are able to provide technical assistance. Funding for these programs and services come from a variety of sources, including student groups and clubs, dedicated student fees, campus investments, and private foundations. We are especially grateful to the Carroll and Milton Petrie Foundation, which during the 2018-2019 academic year awarded $20,000 grants to each undergraduate institution to address student hunger. We have just learned that the Petrie Foundation will be supporting these efforts again for 2019 and 2020, um, and for that we're very, very grateful. Furthermore, CUNY Single Stop Program, now at all community colleges and one senior college, John Jay has provided students with access to food and has screened for SNAP eligibility for almost eight years. In fact, food pantries at the community colleges are maintained by Single Stop. Deborah Hart, my friend and colleague, the founding director of Single Stop at the Borough of Manhattan Community College, is here today to provide more detailed information about Single Stop's contribution to eliminating food insecurity at CUNY. She will also describe BMCC's model outreach program. An innovative program is Healthy CUNY's Food Security Advocates Project that empowers students to educate their peers about programs such as SNAP, WIC, and connect students to food pantries and single stop centers. According to the New York State Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance, the general rule for most college students' eligibility for SNAP is most able-bodied students ages 18 through 49 who are enrolled at least half-time in college or other institution of higher education are not eligible for SNAP. However, there are several exceptions to this rule. That said, we know that there are still students who satisfy one or more of these exemptions, and SNAP outreach and screening remain an important strategy for combating food insecurity. Um, please note that this rule, of course, is a function of federal law and not state law. Um, and in closing, on behalf of the City University of New York, I would like to express our sincere appreciation to the Council for shining a light on the serious issue. As always, we look forward to partnering with the Council to address student food insecurity and its impact on student wellness and success. And again, we most sincerely thank you. I would now like to yield to my colleague, Deborah Hart. Thank you. It's now afternoon. Good afternoon. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Honorable Chairs, Baron and Levin, and Honorable Committee members. I am Deborah Hart, the director of the Single Stop Program at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. It is an honor to be, for me to be here today representing the students of CUNY who experience food insecurity. Thank you for your time. As a child growing up in Guyana, South America, I hated weekends for a good portion of my young life. The reason that I was not a fan of weekends is because I knew that there would either be no food or very little food in my home. My parents did their best to provide their 16 children, but it was not always easy. I recall days of having to drink sugar water, literally water mixed with sugar, or other times that my aunt, who worked at a hospital, bring the leftover food so that we can have some solid food. My favorite part of the week were weekdays. I not only loved school, but I loved learning. And I loved that there would be, at the very least, two meals that I would be able to eat. I enjoyed the milk and cheese biscuit sandwiches, but most importantly, I was happy that I would be able to focus and not experience the headaches associated with hunger. My students at BMCC come to the single stop office, office are often suffering the same level of hunger that I did as a child. 
there's nothing more heart-wrenching than to speak with a student on Monday morning who, is ha who has not eaten in days because there was n either no food to eat or because they chose to pay a bill or use the money for transportation to get to school. BMCC and Single Stop have responded to this level of need by providing students with a cafeteria voucher or a supermarket gift card or access to our food pantry. We're fortunate to have funding to provide this emergency assistance, but in spite of our response, the need is much greater. As an example, from the time we opened the Panther Pantry at BMCC in April of 2018 through January of this year, we've provided over 340 families with over two tons of food. However, during the same period, we were unable to serve over 430 students and family members. Included in that number is 196 children, 205 adults, and 30 seniors. We want to ensure that students have access to the single stop services, and as a result, the BMCC's Office of Student Affairs sends email notifications to students about the availability of the Panther Pantry. Faculty and staff are also notified via email on the operation of the pantry, and they have often referred students they suspect or know to be facing food insecurity or hunger to the, to the single stop for Panther Pantry bags. Furthermore, single stop staff members conduct orientation and classroom presentations to highlight services available for students including the, the Panther Pantry. At campus events throughout the year, single stop staffs are tabled to provide information about the pantry. Advertising for the pantry is also in rotation on inter-campus television screens. Many of our students are being referred via word of mouth from students who have previously utilized the pantry. Additionally, Students coming to the single stop office for other services are screened for food pantry need and eligibility. Our intake process allows us to identify students who are facing emergencies that qualify for food assistance. The single stop office also continues to promote the, the Panther Pantry website to further pub publicize the availability of the pantry to the student body. These outreach strategies, outreach strategies are working. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to bring to your attention the crisis that our students are facing on a daily basis in relation to food insecurity. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning and thank you. Chair Levin and the members of the Committee on General Welfare, and Chair Barron on the and the members of the Committee on Higher Education. We appreciate the opportunity to submit written and abbreviated oral testimony regarding the reduction of food insecurity in New York City, and specifically the City University of New York. I'm providing this, tes I'm providing this testimony on behalf of Hunter College, New York City Food Policy Center, of which I'm the Executive Director. The center works with policymakers, community organizations, advocates, and the public to create healthier, more sustainable food environments. We thank the City Council and the Speaker's Office for their support. Food insecurity is a public health crisis in America, and college students are no exception. And while the GAO review of food insecurity studies amongst college students was not revealing, an educated estimate shows that 35 to 48 percent of college students in the U.S. experience food insecurity, a higher percentage than that of the general population. Among the many possible reasons for this disparity, the fact that students are faced with competing financial obligations, including tuition, housing, textbooks, computers, and of course, food. Unfortunately, some students are forced to choose which of these expenses are most important. The need to make these choices disproportionately impacts low and middle class students as well as people of color. According to a recent survey, uh, 60,000 60, CUNY undergraduates, or 25%, experience food insecurity. And a food report <clears throat> by my CUNY colleagues revealed that approximately 15% of our students reported that they had sometimes or often gone hungry in the past year because they lacked resources to buy food. 25% had to skip a meal 
because they could not afford food, and 30% were sometimes or often unable to access balanced or nutritious food. It should be noted that regardless of whether or not they are food insecure, college students generally have poor eating habits. In fact, nearly 96% do not eat the recommended five or more servings of fruits and vegetables per day. Food insecurity, especially when combined with poor eating habits, can lead to malnutrition and obesity. Food insecurity also impacts mental health, including increased feelings of shame and powerlessness, all leading to stress, anxiety, and possibly depression. Additionally, food insecurity may adversely impact academic performance, behavior, attention, attendance, and rates of graduation. While these facts and statistics apply to colleges and universities across the country, CUNY students have a profile that exacerbates many of these issues and concerns. Finally, research has documented that the habits formed during the college years last a lifetime, thus making the need to resolve students' food security and help them establish healthy eating behaviors all the more crucial. The recent initiatives to create on-campus food pantries are encouraging and important and a step towards improving food security among our students. However, we as public health advocates have learned that simply increasing food access does not necessarily improve healthy eating and or lead to increased consumption of food. For the reasons previously mentioned and building upon the innovative and incredible programming already in place at CUNY, we recommend a few of the following strategies. Number one, provide additional education and promotion about on-campus and local area food pantries. SNAP, WIC, and single stop centers. Promotion should include but not be limited to in-class announcements, physical marketing materials, as well as a strong presence on social media. Two, increase food policy awareness by offering, we have, a, we have set a newly created online multimedia food policy course, which is free of charge to all CUNY students, faculty, and staff. Develop a smartphone tool that can quickly determine a college student's eligibility for SNAP, which you have seen in your briefing report is somewhat complicated. This is particularly important because nearly 60% of eligible college students did not receive the benefits in 2016. Four, a 24-7 smart pantry vending machine. The center has partnered with the founder of Share Meals to develop a technology that will convert a vending, a vending machine into a 24-7 pantry with free healthy food, which includes fruits and vegetables. The goal is to pilot this first smart pantry within the next eight months to a year. Five, expand the current Hunter College and Grow NYC Fresh Food Box program to all CUNY campuses, allowing students to receive a week of local produce at the reduced and subsidized cost of just $14 with the addition of adding those, uh, those vouchers for the food insecure. Six, create a practical and manageable usable guidelines and recommendations for food service on CUNY campuses while incorporating healthy food, sustainability, and food rescue. Seven, develop hydroponic and other outdoor production gardens across CUNY campuses. And eight, increase nutrition and food policy training for all pantry managers and staffers. We at the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center and the City University of New York are eager to implement programs and build upon existing partnerships to combat food insecurity, improve healthy eating, and promote food justice. The bottom line is we believe that healthy food should be a basic human right. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Thank you to the panel for coming. And uh, I do have a few questions. And my colleague will also offer questions to you. You talk about uh, the Panther pa Pantry. How did you get the name? Um, the Nope. I keep forgetting that I speak very loudly with my students. <laughs> um, Panther is actually our, um, our um, mascot okay. at BMCC. Um, but we, we, we ran a competition um, and we received sort of many um, suggestions mm -hmm. for what the names could be. One of them was um, um, something of feeding on the Hudson and um, there were various uh, um, iterations of, of um, suggestions of, of, pa of pantry. Um, but the one that won out was Panther Pantry by vote from the community at BMCC. And how does it operate? What, when a student comes to the Panther Pantry, a little bit of a tongue twister, uh, yeah. what do they, what, what do they <laughs> get? For us too. Um, so 
One of the things that we work very, very um, hard to do is to ensure that our, when our students come to single stop period, mm -hmm. they are comfortable. They are they they feel um, safe, and if they, they know that they um, they will be treated with the the utmost level of respect and and confidentiality. Um, at the reception area, students are greeted with really one basic question: Have you ever visited our office before? And the reason for that is just so that they can complete one one-page intake form, and then a staff in the back of our office would be called forward for the student to then go back and speak with the student. Um, the staff does a, a, a comprehensive assessment of whatever the student says to us that their needs are. Um, uh, for example, they may come in for a metro card and we may discover that food insecurity is, is occurring in the home. We may discover unemployment is occurring in the home. Um, so once we discover whatever the issues are with the student and we, if they're comforted for the pantry, we offer them the opportunity of either coming a, to the pantry with, with us um, and choosing the food, or we have a list of all the food items that are in the pantry in our offices, and they have an opportunity to kind of check off, according to the balance bag, uh, pantry bag, um, to check off the items that they would like to have. So we go and pack the bags and would bring them mm -hmm. to the student. Okay, and in your testimony, it says that the Office of Student Affairs sends email notifications to students about the availability of the pan the pantry. Yes. Do all students get that email notification? Yes. Yes. It, at the, at the um, start of the semester, um, each student received the email blast indicating mm -hmm. that the pantry is available, the hours it's available. We happen to be um, available um, almost all week in the sense that we have to shut down a few hours to either receive food, as we did mm -hmm. um, yesterday. Um, or a few hours to do inventory because as um, IVC Rosa indicated, we do get funding, so we have to keep very careful track of how the, the funds are being spent. So how many students or how many uh, offerings of food do you give? I know you said it's just starting, but what's, what's been the number? So because of the funding, because we have to ensure that um, you know, we're, we're, we're reaching as many students as possible, Oftentimes, we can only limit the, the food to one person in the home. Um, generally, around the holidays, we try to increase that to three family members, which of course increases the number of um, items and food that the student can take. Um, for example, in all of the five food groups, if we increase the, 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 um, the amount to three family members, they're taking upward of about 20 food items, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's cans or boxes or, or pans uh, or, um, or um, bags of food with them. Um, so, you know, th there's a consideration, too, for the students transporting the food. So we talk with our students and encourage them to come at the end of their, their class sessions so that they're kind of um, leaving the campus when they have the food. Um, but, you know, to the degree that we can provide a greater number in the family members with the food, we do that. Um, but oftentimes we've got to be very, very aware of the fact that our funding is uh, really limits um, how many in the home that we can provide on a continuous basis. Uh, before I continue, I do want to acknowledge that we were joined also by Councilmember Kalos, who had to leave, and we still have with us Councilmember Torres. Okay. Is this pantry funded by the $20,000 that you received? Is this yeah. how you're using your $20,000? Yes, yes. That's one of the funding streams that, um, that we have. Okay. Um, it, is the, it is the Petrie funding. BMCC Association has also provided some funding. Um, and um, I wrote a, a small proposal on, and was fortunate to get some funding from United Healthcare, who's been one of our tremendous partners on the campus providing um, enrollment for healthcare services. Um, and there are a few faculty that's actually um, donated some decent funds to the pantry. So we're a little fortunate at this point. But even with that, mm -hmm. the need is really so great that, um, you know, 
and, and, and particularly as we move forward and the pantry becomes even more, uh, or, or the students become even more aware of the mm -hmm. pantry, um, the increase, the, the numbers of students are increasing. This semester alone, uh, the numbers have increased tremendously uh, for those who are using the pantry. Okay, thank you. Um, Dr. Vosa, in your testimony, you talk about um, Governor Cuomo's uh, No Student Goes Hungry. Is there funding from the governor for funding this No Student Go Hungry? Uh, to date, we have not received funding for... So it's a mandate with no funding attached yeah. as of now. Yeah, we've been able to, fortunately, through the, uh, through the support of, of generous foundations like the Petrie Foundation right. to meet that standard. But, but we've, we've been able to, to self-fund that. Right. Well, I think that uh, we all need to send the governor a message. If he thinks this is such a great need, and indeed it is, he needs to make sure that the money is in the budget so to ensure that no student goes hungry. Uh, it's easy to say, but let's back up what we say with some money to make it happen. Um, and also in your testimony, you said that LaGuardia College serves students Monday through Friday on a walk-in basis. Uh, and food items are selected by the student and dispersed. And at Lehman, there's a Dining Dollars program. Could you talk a little bit more about each of those programs? Sure. Um, I, will, uh, I will defer to my colleague, Lori Beck, who is an expert on our food pantries. Okay. But there are two paradigms that we thought are excellent best practices in our campus's response to student insecurity. Um, LaGuardia's commitment is, is similar uh, to BMCC's commitment. Uh, to having a very robust food pantry to meet the immediate needs uh, of students on campus, while Lehman, because of, of space uh, restrictions, mm -hmm. has had difficulty dedicating uh, the pantry space. But their their voucher program allows students to uh, to leverage uh, existing food service resources on campus. Lori, could I ask you? Sure. Could, sure. could you step here to the mic? To the Sorry. Sorry, we need to also swear you in. Sorry, thank yes, you. you can have a seat. Welcome. Okay. Okay, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony uh, and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Yes. Please state your name for the record. My name is Lori, and my last name is Beck. Sorry. Hi, my name is Lori, and my last name is Beck, B E C K. Thank you. Uh, you have testimony you want to provide? No, I'm just sort of supporting Chris's question. Okay, so do you have uh, further information about the programs? Um, the um, the dining, dollars yes. initi dining Dollars Initiative is very interesting. A number of our campuses um, uh, allow you to use your ID to load uh, money for the cafeteria, I mean food at the on-site. So what you do is you purchase dollars that get loaded onto your card and then you swipe it when you go into the cafeteria. So if my money comes, let's say, out of the Petrie Foundation because Student Affairs has added money to my card, and you have your card and you've purchased with your own money, mm -hmm. there's no difference between you and me. I swipe and you swipe. So it's a, it's a policy that really deals not only with um, hunger, but also with the stigma issue. And there are a number of campuses that are um, moving towards this, um, and there are a number of campuses where dining dollars get um, loaded on IDs. Can you supplement what's on your card on your own? Can you add to Yes, that? yes, and that's that's pretty much how it's how it's worked. Um, and but with um, funding from Petrie, we've been able to create opportunities to um, give students money, it gets added to the card, and their dining dollars are the same as anybody else's. How much is on each card that a student gets? How do you determine the amount? Um, the, at Layman, to the best of my knowledge, they do ask for an application, and right now the 
individual grant is $80, um, students can come back and make another application. So it's not just that you're only entitled to that, but the initial, but the, uh, it's $80 that gets loaded. Uh, do you get refills or is it $80? Yeah. You, you can apply again um, and the Office of Student Affairs reviews it and if in fact um, there's a need there, you can get another $80. Is there a cap on how many times you can apply? You know, I don't know that um, the answer to that question, but I certainly can find out. Okay. And at LaGuardia College, do we know how many students take advantage of the uh, walk-in services? I do have the numbers. Unfortunately, I don't have them with me, so I can get it to you this afternoon. Okay. And you talk about, in the testimony, it cites that uh, uh, the School for Professional Studies, most of the students are online students, but uh, a pantry is not feasible, but there's a staff member. Do we have any data on how many students avail themselves of the service? I don't, um, and I can, I, can, I can speak specifically with that school, um, and I can get to that information. Okay, great. Um, I do have a few more questions, and my colleague, I'm sure, has questions as well. We know that it costs approximately $220,000 to operate the single stop. How are those costs uh, used in the, in the program's operation? How do those dollars work? I mean, I, I'll begin in broad strokes, but I'll let a real expert tell you in, in its granularity. So the, the cost of the $220,000 per site funds uh, the director's salary, an assistant director's salary, and pays for the legal services, uh, the benefits referral services, and the tax services in broader strokes. But in terms of the granular details, Deborah, could you speak to that? Yeah. Um, I mean, some of, some of the costs are also um, that, that are included in that would be the space for, for, um, for the operation. Um, I mean, much of, of the program um, services are in kind from CUNY and BMCC um, and the other programs. Um, but mostly, um, I think it's, it's the, the, the staff and, and um, whatever OTPS that's associated with the operation of the program. And do we have a number of students that use the uh, single service? Well, over the past... Um, single, I'm single sorry, stop, single stop. Single stop service. Um, over the past 10 years, BMCC alone has um, seen, almost 10 years, about nine years, BMCC alone has seen close to 30,000 students who've come through our offices. Um, on average, we see about um, 70, 80, 90 students a day. Our, our program, the, BMC, the BMCC Single Stop Program, is the largest of all of the programs mm -hmm. in terms of staffing. Um, there are five of us, um, and well, no, I take it back, there are seven of us. We just got a few additions um, that our, our, um, our administrator is really able to kind of, you know, figure out some creative ways to get us some additional support because of all of the services that come out of single stop at BMCC. We just don't only uh, provide the four core services mm -hmm. that single stop started providing, food, uh, um, taxes and, and health care, um, financial counseling, legal counseling, um, SNAP. Um, we now provide the, um, the, the, the emergency funds. We are the, the repository for the emergency funds that students apply for to assist with rent, for example. Um, and um, we have some additional other programs that, um, that we, or, or populations that we focus on. We focus on the foster care population um, to assist them in any which way that, you know, they may need some additional supports. Um, so with that, we were able to get some additional uh, um, college assistance, for example, 
um, to assist with the, with the operation. So most of our staff, um, well, all of our staff are social workers, licensed social workers. We all social workers um, with social service experience. So it en enables us to really work with this population in, a, in, in identifying and helping to um, to, to either refer or, or um, help them in building sustainable um, plans for, for the issues that they're dealing with. So it's not only just um, addressing the immediate need, the immediate emergency, it's also helping to identify a longer term plan um, in, in helping them to stay in school. In terms of the $20,000 uh, from the Petrie Foundation, is there a way to determine, I understand that, it, did, the, did the foundation indicate that each school should get the same exact amount? Because we know some schools are larger than others. So I'm looking at the equity. And they equal, each school got an equal amount, but I'm looking about the equity. Yeah. Do we have any, did um, they have any conditions in that or? How did that come if about? I, if I could ask Lori, who actually helped to coordinate okay. the proposal, just to respond to the parameters of the, the grant. Um, each of the 18 undergraduate institutions received the same amount, regardless of the size of the institution. And so that was a decision that CUNY made? No, that no. was a, the grantor made. Oh, that was the grantor. Okay, that was my yes. question. Yes, okay, the grantor good. made that decision. Thank you. And in turn, I'm going to stop and ask my colleague to share his questions, and then I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you, um, thank you all for your testimony. I, I just had a question. I guess sort of, let's go for the whole panel, but following up on uh, Mr. Placken's recommendations, um, because there's an, a number of them. You know, how many of these can CUNY do on their own? And you know, is there is uh, maybe why 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 not do them all right now? I guess is the yeah, I think that's a great a great question, I, and we are in the works of doing many of these. Um, for instance, the smart vending, the smart pantry vending, we're, we're we're working with the technology company right now to help with that. Um, the smartphone tool for college students, we we're exploring that right now with with a, with a, an engineer to to do that inexpensively, um, and uh, the increasing, you know, we have the food policy online course that we're developing that we're going to promote to CUNY staff, faculty, and students. Um, we believe that by understanding food policy, it creates awareness around these issues and mm -hmm. there'll, be more, there'll be more opportunity for them to understand food insecurity and hunger issues. Mm -hmm. And then if they relate to that, they can then apply. So to encourage application since probably 50% are not applying when they you know, are at risk or, or have a need to. Right. And, and just to add, um, in terms of the healthy food options, uh, yeah. Campus dining, that's actually a feature of the RFP that is, that's been issued by CUNY. Vendors are responding to that RFP, and that's a dimension that will be part of the evaluation criteria in the selection of a, of a, a food vendor. But like, for example, number five, the recommendation on expanding the Grow NYC Fresh Food Box program to all CUNY students and campuses. Yeah. That's something that could, that CUNY as a, can make that policy decision, it might cost money, but is that something that CUNY would look at doing? Well, I think we were, and, and Chris can answer that, uh, but but I think that what we were, we were test piloting at Hunter right now mm -hmm. on the logistics, and it's also the capacity, so, you know, whether you has Hunter capacity. to do it for every for every student, to be available to every student? We're, we're, it's available right now for every student. Not every student has vouchers, but it's available for every student. So, you know, the idea is to reduce stigma. So any mm -hmm. student can sign up and pay the $14, which is an already subsidized amount, and get a week's worth of fruits and vegetables, which I think is, in, is incredible. Right. Um, and, the, and, you know, testing the logistics of it on campus, um, delivering the boxes and, and, and bagging everything and so mm -hmm. forth. So those things are all being worked out now. And then as we report back to the, to the, you know, the chancellor's office, I think that the idea would be to eventually and hopefully roll something like that out. And, and uh, where is the food coming from in those? Is it like a CSA type thing? Yeah, yes, it comes from Grow NYC's. They're, um, they're from their, from their vendors, from okay. local, from local oh, vendors. Okay. Yeah. Um, Okay, I mean, I would love to see, you know, all of these recommendations, you know, go CUNY-wide. Um, and, you know, you certainly would have support in the council uh, in terms of if, you know, these are 
asks being made to the mayor or the governor in terms of budgetary asks, we, certainly something I think that we would be interested in in supporting. Um, so please let us know. Don't be shy Thank to you. reach Thank out you. for support. Um, I mean, one thing I would say and, um, uh, is that, you know, one thing obviously that we could, that would make an impact on people's ability to uh, have access to, to quality nutrition is to make CUNY free again. So I don't want to leave that out. <laughs> um, I mean, because that would uh, obviously and free food. <laughs> and, and, um, but but uh, we should always keep an eye on that tuition question. So I'll turn it back over to my co-chair. A man after my own heart. Uh, in your 2019-2020 operating budget request, you're requesting 7.8 million as a part of the strategic investment. For, to address hunger for food insecurity. How is that pilot program coming along? What is it looking like? And how many, what's the timeline for it? And how many students are you trying to reach in that project? Uh, so it's a, it's a comprehensive budget uh, that would uh, a, attempt to address uh, a, you know, a, a very significant number of the 35,000 food insecure students that we've identified at CUNY. Um, part of a key element of that would be uh, leveraging this, the swipe card technology that we expect to certainly exist on several of our campuses, but we expect to be more widely available as a new food vendor comes on board. And we, what we would hope to do is look to leverage that funding uh, and also partnership with the food vendor um, in order to uh, create uh, access to food on campus using existing campus vending. Um, and for us, that not only is, uh, solves an, an access issue, but it would absolutely address uh, the stigma that, that is often associated uh, with accessing uh, f healthy food on campus. It would remove that barrier. Um, and we would also, in part, we would look to in, invest in our infrastructure and in the pantries themselves. Um, and um, we have a separate, uh, as you referenced, Chair Barron, we have a separate single stop expansion request, which would invest our, in our capacity uh, for single stop. How does CUNY track food insecure students? I know you have the uh, survey which you ask about income levels and familial status. Have you considered adding a question that addresses uh, food insecurity and whether they have uh, services that they need to address that? How do you know who the students are? You said 35,000. How do you know who they are? Is it just those that uh, have made entree into the system? I mean, to be quite honest, I, I don't know that we, that we, that each and every one of them are individually identifiable to them. That, that number is, is based on research done by the CUNY School of Public Health, by, the, by Healthy CUNY, and um, our, our, my colleague Nick Freudenberg is here uh, in, in, the, in the gallery today, and um, his, he and his colleagues have done research which has resulted in, in, in that telling statistics. So would it, be, would it be feasible to add a question to the student survey that's completed to ask that? Would that be something that we can do? Is that a benefit? Will that help us identify that population? And how can we track students sure. that are, in fact? We could inquire with our Office of Institutional Research okay. and Assessment. Thank you. Sure. The vendors that are located on the various CUNY campuses, do they contract individually with each school, or does CUNY have a, a broader contract that they implement? Uh, at this time, they're, they contract individually, but the current RFP is a university-wide contract, which would, among other things, leverage our buying power to achieve certain priorities on behalf of our students. And one of those, fortunately for us, would be addressing, helping them, engaging them as partners to address food insecurity on our campuses. At present, each vendor on a campus has a contract. That's correct. When do you plan to institute the new university-wide contract system? What's um, the timeline for that? I will ha have to get back to you on that. We're, st we're in the midst of the RFP now, um, and we expect to complete the review of proposals, and, and we expect to award the contract 
within uh, the coming months. In terms of the, the phase in, I would have to get back to you, uh, and I'm pleased to get back to you with the details. I believe at one point there were some questions about the work conditions of the employees of these vendors. That is what is the status now, and well, that, what does that, the RFP, how does that address that issue? That is a prominent feature of our, of our RFP, um, that, there, that there are standards in terms of um, uh, employee equity and, and the standards for the, the employees that are hired by the, by the vendor. So that's a paramount consideration for us in evaluating proposals. Okay, and finally, um, in terms of your, your proposals of what can be done to improve that, uh, vending machines, would they also be able to be uh, part of the swipe and the vouchering system? Students could do those. And how are we going to make sure that it's going to be like the horn and hard art that we used to have years ago, which had some great food. See, nobody, you know, that's beyond those. your time. Yeah, I remember those. Too. You remember? Yeah. Um, the deep dish beef pot pie. We'll skip that one. <laughs> I, you know, I th the idea with this is it's still in development, and the, and the concept is that um, these smart vending machines, which will be uh, an adaptive, adaptive technology that any vending machine can be converted, they'll, uh, you'll use your phone and you'll take a needs test right on your phone. This is the concept right now that we're developing. You'll take a needs test right on your phone, but any student, regardless of whether they're food insecure, will be able mm -hmm. to buy. So you won't know uh, if someone's getting free food mm -hmm. or they're paying for it. And that's the concept here, and we're certainly going to try to integrate and think about how we can use the, the loaded cards as well. And just to build on that, uh, it, fortuitous, yesterday we actually had a demonstration of the technology at our Vice President for Student Affairs meeting at just blocks from here at the Borough of Manhattan Community College. And um, mm -hmm. it, it was encouraging to see the technology in action, to see how you could deliver uh, fresh and healthy food to students at a reasonable price. And uh, one of the benefits of, of our size is that we have significant leverage in terms mm -hmm. of our, our ability to negotiate a, a, a reasonable price for it. And to your point, Charles, um, because it uses an app um, for payment, um, it, it removes any stigma associated with acquiring it. Right. Students, no matter what the source of funds on their app, acquire the food the same way. And there's no, no distinction about people who acquire that food through an app whose the payment for which has been preloaded through, through CUNY or whether you had the means to do it yourself. Okay. Um, thank you for your testimony. I'm going to turn it back to you. Okay. All right, thank you so much for your testimony, you. and I look forward to getting the answers to the questions that I would like to have. Thanks, Chair Barron. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Chair Levin. Thank you, Chair. We have many. Okay, so we have a number of people who have signed up to testify. So we are going to ask uh, people to keep their testimony to three minutes, and we will have a clock running. Uh, first, to testify, Bill Busk, Urban Justice Center, Safety Net Ab Activist. If your name has been called, step up. Thank you. Aisha George, CUNY students. The CUNY University Student Senate. Anel Morales Rojas, River Justice Center. Gabriel Janis. From USS. We have a joint statement. 
Thank you. My name is Bill Busk, and I live in supportive housing in the Tremont section of the Bronx. I've been receiving SNAP benefits since 2009 after becoming homeless and later being disabled due to neurological damage. I first met the Urban Justice Center several years ago when I had difficulty renewing my SNAP food stamps benefits due to my disability. Plus the fact that the city's Human Resources Administration did not follow their own policies regarding closing cases. My case was only reopened and previous lost SNAP benefits restored after UJC represented me in a fair hearing case during which my disability made it difficulty difficult for me to communicate that day. This shows the difficulties that anyone can encounter trying to open or renew a SNAP benefits case. Besides people with language differences, those who are unfamiliar with the HRA system or have other barriers or limitations. And I just want to add, I had noticed the first party speaking, talking about um, mental health barriers or physical. Um, after working for f- 45 years in paying tax in the system over 40 years, I never would have foreseen that oh, I'd be needing s- SNAP food stamps for the past 10 years. So anyone can find themselves in this situation. As a so-called supplemental benefit snap has never fully covered monthly food or nutritional expenses and most people on snap including myself find themselves using using cash income to cover a quarter to half of their grocery costs also having earned earned a degree in business and almost 40 year business background i've noticed that over the past decade using snap that when or if there has been an annual increase in snap benefits it rarely if ever matches inflation this creates a situation where the real dollar value of snap benefits buys fewer and fewer groceries year after year I live in City Council District 15 in the Tremont section of the Bronx, which has an average annual income of below $20,000 per year and one of New York City's densest concentrations of homeless shelters, street homeless, HASA, and supportive housing. So I cannot help noticing that the lines in front of the local pantries get longer continually. I... Do appreciate HRA fo- forwarding February SNAP benefits a month early in the recent federal shutdown, anticipating if it continued. However, the overall SNA- SNAP system still requires improvement. In particular, HRA must also improve its SNAP centers because many people still need in-person assistance to file or renew so Automated systems do not help m- 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 many users. SNAP also does not pay enough for people to get by, and too many people fall through the cracks, which is inexcusable since we're talking about food or nutrition. We're talking about l- lives. Th- thank, you for c- thank you for considering my testimony. Thank you, Bill. Um, I just want to acknowledge we do have uh, members of HRA who are here uh, no. stayed for the state for the testimony. Thank you. Greetings. 
Um, on behalf of the University Student Senate, we would like to present a joint testimony. Um, we will encompass our three minutes each within that one testimony. Thank you. Greetings, Honorable Committee, Chairperson Barron and Levin, and Honorable Council Members. My name is Hercules Reed, and I serve as the Legislative Director for CUNY's University Student Senate. I'm here today with two student leaders from their various campuses, uh, Latasha Lee and Gabriel Jameson. As you may have heard and know, USS is a governance organization responsible for representing the interests of nearly 500,000 students that attend CUNY each academic year. One of the saddest moments that I have experienced when some presidents indicated to me that more and more students appear on their campus are hungry. They have not had breakfast or may have missed a meal that night before. In light of the difficult economic times facing very low income students, I've asked the Office of Student Affairs to develop programs to focus on issues of hunger, nutrition, and homelessness. This was a quote from Chancellor Matthew Goldenstein back in April 27th of 2009. I would like to highlight that you have heard that single stop food pantries and peachy funds exist on CUNY campuses. But I would like to remind you that these services do not exist on every campus. And this conversation is about equity. Food insecurity is defined by the United States Department of Agriculture as having limited or uncertain access to nutrition, safe food necessary to lead a healthy lifestyle. In 2016, a survey said that uh, by, done by 25,242 undergraduate students, 60% of which came from households that made 30,000 or less, um, more than two thirds of these CUNY students are either fully or partially relying on their parents for financial support. Over half of the students work for pay, and over a third of those who do work believe that employment negatively impacts their academic performance and primarily to work, and, and they primarily work to either pay for living expenses or tuition, which was mentioned earlier. In 2001, a campaign for Healthy CUNY released a report on food insecurity. Information was gathered from 17 campuses, which you can read in the testimony. Some of the questions that were asked were, how often did you worry that you were, did not have enough, food for, have enough money for food? How often did you cut or skip a meal because you did not have enough money to buy food? How often were you unable to balance a nutritious meal because of the lack of money? And how often did you go hungry because of a lack of money? The survey was conducted in the spring and fall of 2010. Two of every five CUNY students in this sample reported that they experienced food insecurity in the past 12 months. This would translate that almost 100,000 of the 25,000 experienced some form of food insecurity. Black and Latino CUNY students ha are known to have higher rates of food insecurity than others. For example, in the survey, that population was 1.5 times more likely to report food insecurity than white and Asian students. Students who support themselves financially were 1.6 times more likely to report food insecurity. Students working more than 20 hours per week had a higher rate of food insecurity than those who did not work. Students who said common symptoms of depression, who had common symptoms of depression were two times as likely to report food insecurity as those without symptoms. My name is Latasha Lee. I'm a psychology major at Bronx Community College. I'm amongst the students in CUNY who's a parent and student. I'm a mom of two beautiful little, I became a mom of two beautiful little boys before making a decision to pursue higher education. It's for that reason that I decided to come here and speak to you guys today. As a student leader and mother, I've been able to experience how lack of food affects an individual firsthand, and I've also experienced the outcome of what happens to my own children when they eat late. As a student leader, I've worked directly with students who suffer from food insecurity. Although my children are very young and have yet to experience college, they've been through. there have been times when we're running extremely behind schedule and simply don't have time for breakfast. And almost every single time that this happens, I'm told by one of their teachers, one of their teachers that they've had a difficult morning. It didn't take me long to see the correlation. I understood that missing a meal, even one, is enough to make them misbehave. I took this issue so I take this issue so seriously because their education is essential to me. Now I don't let them leave the house without breakfast, regardless of how late we're leaving. Unfortunately, I'm less dedicated to my own well-being. There are times when I don't eat breakfast or lunch simply because I don't have time, and I'm sure you guys can understand that. As a full-time student and an active leader on my campus for the university, eating can sometimes be an additional task. 
Oftentimes, I miss a meal and I don't operate to the best of my ability. It becomes difficult for me to focus in class and on exams. Not only that, my mental health becomes easily impacted. The truth is that I'm less pleasant when I haven't eaten. And to be completely honest, there have been instances where I truly believed that pursuing higher education was a mistake. And then I eat and I'm completely and I'm in a completely different mindset. And this is not unique to me. Imagine having to constant, constantly worry about where your next meal is coming from. When I'm advertising events on my campus, I'm consistently being asked whether or not there'll be food. You have no idea how many times I've had students tell me that they weren't interested in a workshop and then change their mind at the mention of free refreshments. It has, been, it has become so apparent that now when I'm creating flyers, I put free refreshments or food, and I've seen a significant increase in attendance. One time, one of my friends was laying, on the lounge, laying down in the lounge area at a time when he had class, and I asked why he didn't go. And he told me that he was too hungry to be thinking and that it would be easier just to sleep. When our students are forced to sleep so that they don't have to deal with intense hunger pains, then we have to ask ourselves whether or not we're doing all we can to combat food insecurity. At BCC, we're fortunate enough to have the single stop program. This is extremely beneficial to our students who are food insecure. However, without adequate funding, this program can't function to the best of its ability. To many of our students, single stop is their only food option. The problem with that is that single stop literally only allows a single stop per individual a month. This means that students who rely on, solely on this program must seek other options the other 29 to 30 days. Could you, without guilt, ask anyone to sustain by eating once a month? Another issue is that we provide uncooked food and a lot of our students are homeless. What good is a frozen chicken to someone without a stove? The worst part is that BCC is actually a lot better off than some schools regarding food insecurity. Some, student, some schools don't have single stop. We advocate on these students' behalf and believe that the city can do more to provide support to these students in need. In regards to food insecurity, we ask that you provide adequate funding for pantry supplies. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel James. I'm a mega Arts college student. I'm here to talk about community. I'm here to talk about uh, in food and food security, insecurity. Uh, com from, coming from a community like Browns in East New York, where 27% of the population live below poverty, the reason why is that because Browns in East New York has no love. Love stands for today is Valentine's Day, so I'm going to teach y'all what love means. So love means legacy, ownership, vocation, and education. So while we talk on the topic of education, ed population, the population from my community, only 10% of them go to college, and that's really sad. That's a, that's a low turnout. All of our students should be going to college, but they're not going to college. And then when they transition into college, the another uh, uh, problem that we face when we transition, they think it's going to be better, but it has to get worse. It has to get worse. Going to a school like CUNY, and CUNY is an affordable school, that is good. Uh, but now we're, asked, we're forcing our students to make a decision between a textbook and a hot meal. That's outrageous to me. The good news behind this, CUNY did a recent study. CUNY, we found out in CUNY that food insecurity students are 39% higher than adult and households among the U.S. and New York City. That's one, that's one data behind it. Other thing I'd like to address today is the good news that CUNY has a lot of food pantries, and that's good, but the problem that we face in the food pantry, our students' activity fees are actually paying for the food pantry. To me, that's outrageous, and we should be ashamed of ourselves. That's like asking a homeless, host, or a homeless person to pay for a shelter. That's sad. We shouldn't be having students paying for the tools that they need to be hungry. We should be solving these problems. I would like to thank the, the, I would like to thank the committee and I would like to say, take the concept of what I just told you about love and love yourself, love your community, and love your constituents, and do the right thing by taking that same concept of love and allocating the funds into higher education pantry funded. Thank you, everyone. With the remainder. Sorry, with the remainder of his time, I just wanted to actually read a, another student's um, briefly testimony. Uh, they couldn't make it. I just want to highlight some things. Um, this student name was is Sadat Rahman, and he's from York College. One of the many problems uh, we are facing on our, we face on our campus that I really focus on was making sure um, we are mindful of healthy food options, but are also paying attention to people's dietary restrictions, like many Muslims and Jewish students who are who are only allowed to eat halal or kosher food as a part of their religion. If many of our CUNY and students, SUNY schools are all for having diverse background, diverse background populations in their schools, then why should they be able to limit restrictions in the type of foods everyone should or should not eat? 
He also goes on to say, I would like to say that it is essential that we play that we pay attention to this critical matter to make sure everyone gets a choice despite religious dietary restrictions in what food they can or cannot eat. He is requesting that an increased connection between city, New York City's many food assistance programs on CUNY campuses expand, and there is an assisting in creating more on-site food pantries and food assistance programs. Thank you again for listening to us. Hello, everyone. Thank you all for everything that you do. It's greatly appreciated. Hello, my name is Aisha George. Um, I recently graduated from Bronx Community College with an associate's degree in nutrition and dietetics and currently attend Lehman College majoring in community health education and nutrition. Three years ago, I found myself working long and stressful hours as a restaurant office manager. Believing I was at a dead end job, I decided to go back to school to grow beyond my then academic and occupational endeavors. I quickly discovered, however, that I was unable to meet my basic expenses. With resources such as single stop, Bronx Community Colleges, uh, food and garden club, and knowledge obtained from my curriculum courses, I am able to use these tools to satisfy my essential needs. Attending classes at Bronx Community College, but behind in bills, I became aware of the financial counseling services at single stop. After my first counseling session, I realized that I was at a deficit and got advised to apply for SNAP. I surprisingly qualified and began receiving benefits, which equates to under $48 per week. I started, I started to search for ways to stretch this amount. One major way, was, one major way being the, food, the school's food pantry, which distributes once or twice per month. In my curriculum courses, I studied exactly what food groups I needed to stay healthy, full, and focused throughout the day. I learned, I learned, by, choosing, I learned by choosing foods lower in the food chain that it could reduce costs drastically. I then applied this knowledge to the Food and Garden Club where I was introduced to methods of preparation, planning, and even growing plant-based items in cost-effective and time-saving ways. Eventually becoming the club's president, I, earned, I heard from my fellow cl club mates on how much they learned and how they implemented these practices with their families. Here I gained the confidence I needed to prepare, to not only prepare my own food at home, but to grow them as well. The club also ignited my love for urban gardening and the fresh fruits and vegetables acquired from this process. From this, I started regularly visiting my local farmer's market where fresh, fresh local fruits were sold at an affordable price. It takes much, much determination and planning to sustain this period in my life as a student. Although I have become pretty good at budgeting and planning, life often gets in the way. Whether it be a shortage of benefit funds or lack of time to prepare, I find myself purchasing food from the school's cafeteria where a six ounce cup of fruit can be almost $5. In closing, I ask that the attention be brought to funding needed to properly sustain resources such as single stop service like food pantries, clubs similar to Bronx Community College's Food and Garden Club, in addition to the high cost of cafeteria items. I would also like to see farmers markets on college campuses as well as extending farm share options to CUNY, CUNY campuses. Without resources from Bronx Community Colleges, Single Stop and the Food and Garden Club, I may not likely have been able to graduate on time, adding to overall costs and delayed achievements. While these circumstances are not ideal, I do remain hopeful in the near future where I am self-reliant. After obtaining my degree in health in community health education and nutrition, I will use these tools to, I will use these tools and lived experience to guide members of my community to food security. Thank you. I want to thank the panel for coming. We always benefit from hearing firsthand uh, from the experiences of those who've been impacted by the situations that they face. We do thank you. And congratulations for graduating on time. Thank you. All the best. Thank you.
thank you so much to this panel, and thank you for your, your, uh, your recommendations. We look forward to working with you to see them implemented. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, I just wanted to double check. Uh, Anel Morales Rojas? Hi. We'll have you join the next panel. Uh, Nicholas Friedenberg, Frodenberg. Hey. Sorry, Nicholas, hello. Dr. Tanzina Ahmed. Maggie Dickinson. We have Hostos Food Security Advocates and Hostos Students. And then John Krinsky. Sorry, it's a big panel. <laughs> Sorry, we might have to do some musical chairs, but. We've been joined by Council Member Mark Traeger. Okay, whoever wants to go next. Okay, well, my name is Anel Morales. Ooh, let me move this closer. Um, so my name is Anel Morales Rojas, and I am a tenant and benefits advocate for the Safety Net Project at the Urban Justice Center. In discussing food insecurity, I would like to touch on the institutional factors that prevent full access to food assistance, such as significant delays, documentation errors, barriers to SNAP worker efficacy, public charge, the closing of major Brooklyn centers, and the errors that arise from ABOD. HRA provides a wide variety of supported services and it strides to fight income inequality and poverty. Nonetheless, the deterrent nature of social services compromises the livelihoods of New Yorkers, as benefits regularly discontinue or delay due to a variety of avoidable errors. With ongoing pressure from the current presidential administration and a racialized bootstrap mentality, more than ever have recipients of these benefits been unjustifiably stripped of their benefits. Significant factors contributing to inordinate food insecurity in New York City are delays and errors in SNAP processing. With outdated systems and the closing of major Brooklyn centers, many cases are left in application pending status for much longer than the mandated 30-day period. Mm. Here, we want to draw the committee's attention to the detrimental impacts these processing delays have on applications. For privacy reasons, they'll be referred to as Miss C. So Miss C, a resident of bedford Stuyvesant, Brooklyn, applied for new ongoing SNAP benefits on June 4th, 2018 for themselves and their child. Three months later, they still had not heard from the agency regarding their case. Without financial support from food stamps, she was unable to pay her rent, falling more and more behind on rent as the months went on. Benefits were finally issued 115 days later, approximately four months after the initial center visit when the Urban Justice Center stepped in. Application delays forced this family to decide between food and shelter, a dilemma no person should face. We address this further in our written testimony, as well as recommendations of what we believe would improve efficiency for HRA. But in this moment, I would like to focus on time, a common thread in the issues mentioned in the written, system, written testimony and what I just said before you today. It is the loss of time when someone has to travel to most furthermost corner of Brooklyn to then wait hours before being seen. It is not enough time existing when eligibility specialists are forced to process cases inaccurately to meet a far-fetched quota. It is the abuse of time when SNAP workers are not properly trained, rather throw into a sea of clients in emotionally traumatic situations. And finally, the essence of time. As mentioned earlier, the receipt of food stamps could save a family from ever having to choose between going hungry and having a place to sleep. In summary, households should not be forced to go without food because of HRA's insufficient funding, technological problems, or callousness towards its clients. Yet, in the violation of the city's legal obligations, household regu households regularly suffer due to the aforementioned issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. 
I'm Nick Freudenberg, Distinguished Professor of Public Health at the City University of New York Graduate School of Public Health and Director of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. I also direct Healthy CUNY, a university-wide initiative that helps CUNY students to overcome health problems that interfere with academic success. Since 2010, I've conducted three surveys, the surveys that my colleagues were talking about before. Uh, this was in 2010, 2015, and 2018 of representative samples of CUNY students at our community college and four-year schools to demonstrate the prevalence of food insecurity and assess the efficacy of campus food security services. I'll briefly summarize our findings and then suggest several actions that CUNY, New York City, and New York State can take to reduce the rate and adverse impact of food insecurity in our students. Our first survey in 2010, taken when uh, the then Chancellor Matt Goldstein asked my group to uh, look into what he was hearing from college presidents was an increased prevalence of food insecurity among our students at the height of the financial crisis. We found that 39% of CUNY undergraduates were food insecure. By 2015, this rate had dropped to 22%, and in early 2018, when we did our third survey, to 20%. To put a face on these numbers, an estimated 82,000 CUNY students were food insecure in 2010, 55,000 in 2015, and only 50,000 in 2018. In 2010, almost 48,000 CUNY undergraduates reported the most serious form of food insecurity, that they were often or sometimes hungry in the last 12 months. And by 2018, that number has fallen to about 32,000. And this decline in the number of food insecure students at CUNY is a significant accomplishment. And you heard about some of the reasons. I think one of the important reasons is the improved economic situation in New York after the recovery. Uh, as well as the changes in SNAP programs that we heard from the HRA administrator early on and the CUNY programs, the 13 food pantries and the single stop enrollment programs. In addition, CUNY has extended food security outreach and education. But despite this progress, more work needs to be done. According to our surveys, in 2018, almost about 8% of CUNY undergraduates reported using any food assistance programs. And this was only an increase from 7%. So we need to do much more. Most of our food insecure students are not getting help on our campuses, according to our surveys. Our 2018 survey also found that about 9% of CUNY students, more than 21,000 individuals, reported that hunger or lack of food has interfered with their schoolwork in the last 12 months. And we believe from our data, and this uh, follows up on the GAO report that came out just a few weeks ago, that a significant portion of CUNY students that should be eligible for SNAP are in fact not enrolled. And that brings me to my recommendations. Healthy CUNY, the university-wide initiative to promote student health for academic success, has proposed that CUNY, New York City, and New York State commit to ending food insecurity among CUNY students in the next five years, by 2023. That goal, we believe, is ambitious but achievable, and we invite the City Council to work with us, CUNY, and the state to achieve that goal. And here are some recommendations, and I'll focus on the ones that you haven't already heard. First, and you'll hear from one of our food security advocates that were trained to campaign against stigma and to uh, acquaint students uh, uh, who worked at John Jay and Hustos Colleges last year. We believe every CUNY student should prepare students uh, to provide uh, outreach and education. Our surveys show that a significant proportion of CUNY students still don't know about the services that are available on their campus, and we believe training students to provide that education could increase uh, enrollment. And our second major recommendation is we believe HRA, CUNY, uh, and, and the city and state should do concentrated 
uh, campaigns to enroll all eligible CUNY students in SNAP. We believe there's much more work that can be done, and we would be happy to work with HRA to design that. And we also believe, and I hope others will later talk about this, that New York State should be looking to uh, follow the lead of other states, such as Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and New Jersey, to modify federal rules to extend the opportunity to enroll in SNAP for college students who don't meet the requirements. Other states have done it, New York could do it, and we believe it would be a relatively simple step, but the, uh, the governor and the state legislature need to get, be encouraged to take that step. I've taught at CUNY for 40 years. I've seen how hard our students work to succeed in school and succeed in life, and I've seen how food insecurity sometimes makes that harder. As a city, as a country, we should not be asking our students to choose between being hungry and being educated. And we look forward to working with you to achieve that goal of ending that. Thank you. I have one question following up. Um, those other states that got that waiver um, on SNAP, did they, was that during the current administration or the prior administration? It's been relatively recent. New Jersey just implemented this, and my colleague Joe Berg, I think, will be able to tell you a little more about that. Uh, it involves uh, if people are involved in a publicly funded educational job training program, mm -hmm. they uh, aren't held to the same rules. And by certifying the entire CUNY system as a publicly funded job training system, New York might be able to do that. Just one other uh, very poignant obstacle, the, the requirement that people work more than 20 hours a week. Most jobs at CUNY are 19 hours a week, and most part-time jobs are 19 hours or less. And the reason for that is employers don't want to pay the added benefits when someone goes over 20 hours. And again, as my colleague, the CUNY student, said, we shouldn't be asking students to pay for their own food, you know, if they're food insecure. We shouldn't be asking students to bear the burden of food insecurity because employers don't want to pay extra benefits. Great. Thank you. And Joe, you're on the next panel, so we'll hear from you. Okay. Hello. Oops. Is this on? Yeah. Oh. Okay, wonderful. That's a great start, everyone. Uh, I really am establishing my authority right now. So my name is Tanzina Ahmed, and I'm an assistant professor at CUNY Kingsborough Community College, and I especially want to talk about the needs of community college students who are somehow, it's almost improbable, even poorer <laughs> and more disadvantaged than the regular general uh, college student population of CUNY. So we have heard a great deal about how 40% of students, 20% of students at CUNY colleges are food insecure. But when you narrow your focus down to especially looking at community colleges where the predominant uh, majority of students come from low-income minority populations, the numbers of food insecure students are almost unbelievable. In 2017, with the support of Dr. Rosica Ilieva of the uh, CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, I did a study at CUNY Bronx Community College where we found that 80% of the students were reporting either severe or um, some level of moderate food insecurity. 80%. And unfortunately for these students, they were in a campus that often contributed to their food insecurity. You know, as my as other students who've been to Bronx Community College can tell you, it is a school that offers a wonderful level of support in some way. It is a school that opened up a food pantry in 2016 where they now offer grab-and-go boxes, and that really helps students. But at the same time, it is a school where when you go to the student cafeteria, your average sandwich costs $7, your average salad costs $8. How are students who are living at or below the poverty line going to afford meals? In fact, they do not eat. What they often do the majority of the time, they go to vending machines and get candy bars and other snacks instead. So I, I'm really grateful to hear today about all the testimony about people who look at how these programs, these awesome vouchers, uh, these other issues are working to help alleviate the the food insecurity of CUNY community college students and other CUNY students. But I do believe that there needs to be a greater emphasis also on understanding what about students who are not going to use these voucher programs? What about these students who are not going to go um, and get SNAP 
a snap through the single stop office. And we also have to think about how do we teach students to use and understand more about the food system. So for instance, CUNY Kingsborough Community College, my uh, current and hopefully forever occupation home, is a leader in advocating for students' food security. We have an amazing urban farm that supplies students to thousands of students every single growing season. And what happens is that we also run a bring it home program where we offer students cooking classes. We tell them, come in and we will show you how to grow your food. We will show you how to take this produce that you may have never seen before and make healthy snacks and salads and all of these other wonderful things out of it. But the problem is that we often do not get enough funding. There is stop and go funding. Every semester we are frantically looking around for money with like chickens with our heads cut off. And because of that, you know, it's hard to be able to accommodate all the students who are in need. Even the students who come to us, which is, again, a minority of the student populations, it's difficult to tell them you can only take one item today because otherwise we will run out of food. So if we um, could please get more funding, not only for single stop offices, which do amazing work, but for also programs like Bring It Home, programs like the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, we can empower students not only to feed themselves in the moment and do well in their classes in the moment, but also to get nutritional learning that they can bring home to their families and their communities every day. Thank you very much. Okay. So good afternoon, council members of the Committee of Higher Education and the Committee of General Welfare. My name is Carla Ignacio, and I'm a food security advocate from Hostel Secure Community College. Last year, I worked with CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute on an initiative called CUNY Food Security Advocates Project that empowered me to share resources available to combat food insecurity at my campus with other students. Before I joined this project, I had been, wor been working at SingleSAP, a program that addresses food insecurity by providing students with many resources on and off campus. SingleSAP helps hungry students by providing them a direct link to apply for SNAP also known as food stamps, and at hostels, our single staff office also provides access to the campus food pantry and food pantries of campus. This is done on campus to help students succeed. Together with other students, food security advocates, we design campaigns to help other students to know the importance of having food security and let them know about the resources available on campus. In partnership with the Food Studies Program at Hostels, we grew our own vegetables using hydroponics hours and gave the produce to the student at no cost. In the South Bronx, we are fortunate to have a farmer's market near our campus. And with the help of the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, we created and implemented farmer's markets tour and distributed health box, which are $2 coupons that can be used to purchase fresh food and vegetables at all New York City farmer's market. I was able to do this this summer, and the food study students kept both of these activities going through the fall. Through my work on this project, students were able to access healthy alternatives to the processed food that saturates my campus community and our neighborhoods. During my time at Hostels, I never experienced hunger. I was part of multiple clubs, knew many people on campus, and did work study program that allowed me to work during the times I did not have class. On a regular basis, I was offered food at least four times. I was involved in organizing campus events where food was available, people brought food to my workspace, and my friends invited me to lunch. On top of that, I work at single stop, with a food pantry at my disposition in case I had an emergency and needed a snack. However, I know that my experience with hostels regarding food is not the same as most CUNY students. Because of my network, I was able to feel food secure. Your typical CUNY students usually does not have that and is more likely to experience food insecurity as a result. One student writes, at school, healthy options are non-existence. If I had not the opportunity to go grocery shopping and bring my own food from home, finding food to eat throughout the day is a challenge. More often than not, I only eat once a day, either in the beginning and morning time or late in the evening. After I finish work. Even though I'm able to carry on throughout the day and, co and accomplish what needs to be done, I can often get irritated and cranky because I'm running on an empty stomach. 
There is a lack of food access in our neighborhood, Mount Haven, where Hostos is located. Fast food outlets around us, where the cheap options are often unhealthy food. Our school has over 7,000 students on campus each semester, and many do not have the financial resources needed to purchase healthy food, have the time to prepare it, or the luxury of a break to run out and get food between classes. Students in a rush to get to class often get these foods because they are what's most available and increase the possibility of having poor health later in life. In 2011, a report titled Food Security at CUNY, results from a survey of CUNY undergraduate students, found that two in every five CUNY students, or 39.2%, had experienced food insecurity in the last 12 months. The same study also found a correlation between health problems and food insecurity, finding that students who reported their health as fair or poor were 1.5 times more likely to experience food insecurity than their peers who reported good health. Although a large percentage of students were found to be food insecure, only a small percentage utilized public assistance programs. Only 7.2% of the survey students have utilized food assistance programs in the last 12 months, and only 6.4% of them received SNAP. A 2018 survey found that food insecurity was now experienced by one in every five students, a significant drop, but that's still too many college students to be hungry. We would like to oh. point out. Mr. Ignacio, would I, could I ask you to uh, maybe jump to the recommendation portion oh, yeah, of your sure. yeah. Okay. So effectively reduce the food insecurity of college students in New York City. The CUNY Food Security Advocates and the Food Study Students at Hostels drafted the following recommendations. Establish single stop centers on all CUNY campuses and strengthen single stop in CUNY community college schools through more funding and support for promotion of the program. Provide classes and workshops about food insecurity around CUNY campuses and non-food related classes. Provide health books at the, at the student health centers or use them as incentives to get more students to come to single stop. Provides a substantial amount of meal vouchers for students in stream food insecurity. Reband the cafeteria for food available across CUNY schools and require the school's cafeteria to provide more healthy options, low cost meals, and options to accommodate students with food restrictions. We therefore ask that the City Council and the Committee of Higher Education and General Welfare to consider putting more financial resources into single staff. We think this will directly increase CUNY students' NAP registration, providing tuition packages with meal plans included for CUNY students, creating service-based jobs or activities where students could help the campus and in turn earn free meals on campus through campus dining. And lastly, supporting CUNY schools that want to start or expand garden or farming programs to grow food on campus. At Hostos, our hydroponic towers get the whole campus excited about eating fresh food. We think this will help every campus support the health of all CUNY students. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, thanks so much to the council for having this hearing today. Um, I am not going to reiterate a lot of the data that you've heard that has been put together by uh, colleagues at Healthy CUNY. Um, but, uh, and I also want to thank our students who testified earlier to really lay out the scope of the problem on campus. Um, I'm Maggie Dickinson. I'm an assistant professor at Gutman Community College. Um, so what I want to do today is to talk a little bit about a report that um, I worked on with my colleague Nick Freudenberg um, that proposes ways of thinking about ending food insecurity at CUNY in the next five years. Um, and I just want to highlight some proposals that maybe have uh, got not gotten as much attention today. Um, so one of the things I want us to think about is that CUNY students are New Yorkers. The issues that New Yorkers face in accessing food are the same issues that CUNY students face in accessing food. Um, we also know that among college students, um, they enroll in SNAP at lower rates than the general population. And it's unclear why. 
So one of the things I'd like to propose is working with CUNY, with Single Stop, with faculty, students, and staff, and also with the city to get a better understanding of building a close relationship between HRA and Single Stop to understand why our college students aren't enrolling in, in SNAP at the same levels. Um, these are questions that would be helpful to have answers to, to do a lot of the work that people have talked about, enrolling more of our students in SNAP. Um, I also understand, you know, the issues with barriers to enrollment at the HRA offices. That I know that's a cultural shift and the city's been doing a lot of work on that and I think that's terrific. But making our welfare offices a more welcoming place to minimize stigma, um, to make it easier for students and all New Yorkers to access benefits. And also to maximize the, one of the student populations who I see who struggle the most are my students who are parents who have young children. And one of the things we haven't talked about much today is access to cash assistance. Um, and so I think that's another area where I have seen students struggle to maintain cash assistance cases to support themselves economically while they're in school. And when they're not able to maintain those cases, I, I lose those students and it's heartbreaking. Um, so I think these are all areas where we could do better and your oversight is really important. The other thing I want to emphasize is this idea of, you know, pantries are important and Single Stop does an amazing job. But the other thing that we need to do at CUNY is to really think about how we're using our food service. Um, one of the things that we imagine in the report that we wrote are food service providers on our campuses who are providing low cost, healthy meals to all of our students at a nominal cost. This would mean right now CUNY sees food service as a revenue stream because we are all dealing with austerity budgets. What we need to do is to start to see food service as a retention effort and as a student support service. So the stories that students were telling us before about food on campus being so expensive, and especially Bronx Community College, you know, there's not a lot of food options up there. Uh, where I am in Midtown Manhattan, first of all, Gutman does not have a cafeteria at all because we still need a permanent building. Um, but we're also in Midtown. Our students can't afford to eat. We're on 40th Street across from Bryant Park. There aren't affordable options nearby for our students. So I think making a commitment to affordable, low-cost meals for all of our students is an institutional commitment that CUNY could make that would go a long way. We do this in elementary school and high schools. This happens in many countries in Latin America. There are low-cost programs on college campuses to feed students to support their education, and CUNY could really be a leader on this nationally. Uh, good morning, uh, members of the General Welfare and Higher Education Committees, and um, uh, thank you very much for having this. Uh, uh, hearing. My name is John Krinsky. I'm a professor of political science at City College uh, New York and the CUNY Graduate Center. Um, my testimony this morning is a brief summary of research that I did with students in an introductory methods class last semester. We did a statistically robust survey of City College students that found that focused on housing and food insecurity. Our findings largely mirror those found in Dr. Dr. Sarah Goldick Rabb of Rutgers and Dr. And, uh, Dr. Nicholas Freudenberg's uh, research at CUNY, uh, who've done CUNY-wide uh, studies of the same issues. Um, briefly, we had three. Uh, we had several key findings. Uh, first, 46.6 percent of our students reported skipping meals or cutting back on food due to, uh, for lack of money during their college careers. Again, this means that we're 95% certain that between 41.6 and 51.6% of CCNY students cut back on food or skip meals because of a lack of funds. Translated into actual numbers of people, that's between 6,864 and 8,514 city college students alone who experience food insecurity. As a professor, it's sobering to know that up to half of any class may be coming to class hungry or making the choice between keeping the lights on and eating. Certainly, students often feel as if these issues and the housing issues I'll describe in a moment affect their grades and ability to be good students. If we are interested in making CUNY the world-class institution it can and should be, we can't ignore this, and no, you aren't, clearly. This, of course, is also a message that needs to be heard in Albany. On housing, I'm, uh, and on housing, I think housing is important because of how much people spend on housing. We found that 28.4% of our total number of respondents reported having had one of the following four conditions during college. 
Have you moved more than twice in a month during your academic career? Have you crashed with a friend or family member for lack of a place to go? Have you stayed overnight in college, not in a dorm, for lack of a place to go? And have you stayed in a homeless shelter while you were in college? So that's 28.4% of our respondents. These are important markers of being homeless, with only the most obvious staying in shelter registering with official statistics as homeless. It gives a measure of the depth of the problem we face, even net of the current population of our shelters. If we add to these numbers students who report either having had trouble paying rent or having been forced out of their housing due to personal conflicts, domestic violence, or other causes, we arrive at a figure of over 42.7% or 221 of 516 students who report significant housing insecurity. And this is nearly the same figure uh, overall as Professor Freudenberg found CUNY-wide. Um, it's... Um, the, the majority of our students, nearly two-thirds, work mostly part-time, and another 20% are unemployed or looking for work. 78% of our respondents lived with their parents. It's clear that neither work nor living with parents had a significant protective effect against food and housing insecurity. 113 or 76% of the students experiencing homelessness episodes lived with their parents. So this is, this, what, what this points to, again, is this idea that actually CUNY students are just like other New Yorkers, just like their parents. Um, they come from all over the city. And, um, and it's important then, therefore, that the eviction prevention funds and the food pantries, uh, they, they, as important Band-Aids as they are, are definitely Band-Aids on a much, much larger uh, wound. And just finally, and I'm trying to be mindful of the time, um, one of the things that I want to emphasize, two, two quick things I want to emphasize is we didn't survey faculty at CUNY, but the adjunct faculty at CUNY lives in on sub-poverty wages. They get paid uh, roughly $3,500 a course. Um, usually that works out to no more than about $28,000 a year. Um, so they're living in poverty, and we didn't actually survey adjuncts, and, and I know my union probably should, and we probably have figures on it, I just don't know. The other thing is that I would urge the council to really think holistically about this. So when you do rezonings, and when you do other land use, dis you know, land use dispositions where that, that threaten l low and moderate income people in neighborhoods all around New York with displacement, when people are displaced, they tend to end up paying more money for their next lease. And this affects people all over the city, and it affects, I know firsthand from stories from my students, it affects CUNY students as well, and spills right over into the food security issues that are, that are central to the hearing today. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much to this panel. We greatly appreciate your testimony. Um, and we look forward to working with all of you. And these are really important points that you've all raised. Thank you. Um, next panel, A Ariel Sovransky, UJA Federation, Joel Berg, Hunger Free America, Nicole DeRue, Food Bank of New York, Rebecca Glass, City Harvest, and Rachel Sabella from No Kid Hungry. Whoever wants to begin. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Levin, Chairperson Barron, and members of the General Welfare and Higher Education Committees. My name is Mikola Daru, and I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs at Food Bank for New York City. And I'm also joined here today by Nick Buse, who I think is in the back there, our Community Mobilization Manager. 
Uh, I also know that the council has worked with my predecessors, Triata Stampus and Rachel Stabella, who's also here today, uh, for many years on reducing food insecurity across New York City, and I want to thank you for continuing to make anti-hunger programs a priority. Our written testimony provides you with a comprehensive summary of our most current reflections on and strategies for reducing hunger for all New Yorkers, with a lot of supporting examples, details, statistics, and recommendations. So I won't read all that today, here and now, but I do want to spend these few minutes to highlight the essential investment New York City has made to the Emergency Food Network as well as the emerging threats to low-income New Yorkers, which put in stark relief the need to continue to fortify the network of food pantries and soup kitchens that serve as our city's backstop against hunger. First, a huge thank you to, uh, to Speaker Johnson, Chairperson Levin, Council Member Gradenchik, and the entire New York City Council, who collectively fought for years to increase baseline food funding for New York City's Emergency Food Assistance Program, or EFAP. As a major important source of food for our city's emergency food network, EFAP plays a crucial role in reducing hunger because it provides a steady year-round supply of nutritious food for the approximately 500 New York City food pantries and soup kitchens that participate. We applaud the City Council for its leadership in fighting to do the most good for our neighbors in greatest need with the fewest resources. Supporting the network of emergency food pri providers would not be possible without our partnership with the Human Resources Administration. We look forward to continued collaboration with HRA, not just on emergency food distribution, but on connecting New Yorkers to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, better known as SNAP, which is the first line of defense against hunger. As we mark our progress and some of these victories and look ahead to the future, I want to underscore that we are in an exceptional moment in the fight against hunger. Uh, within the past year, there have been repeated explicit attacks on the food security of many of our most vulnerable neighbors. Two recent actions by the Trump administration, both of which were mentioned earlier by others here today, threatened to push many of those New Yorkers deeper into food insecurity. Uh, as noted earlier, proposed changes to the public charge test would force immigrants to choose between getting food they need and seeking legal permanent residence. The administration is also attempting to subvert Congress by punishing and stripping benefits access from unemployed and underemployed adults without dependents who aren't able to document a disability. Congress already voted to reject this harmful ABOD plan by removing it from the recently negotiated Farm Bill. As advocates have pushed against these actions, service providers have needed to step up and do more in the wake of the recent government shutdown. During the past few months, 18,000 federal workers and additional contractors impacted in the city found themselves exposed to new vulnerabilities. By necessity to put, put food on the table, many furloughed workers who went without a paycheck for more than a month suddenly needed to do what was previously unthinkable, seek food assistance from community organizations and or learn how to access emergency SNAP benefits. Federal workers who were required to continue working without pay through the shutdown were limited to seeking help from charities that could accommodate their work schedules, with some resorting to rationing food for themselves and their children and tapping into limited savings to cover un other non-negotiables like housing and transportation. The reopening of the government has not ended food insecurity or the strains on the charitable network and the many who rely on it. The Emergency Food Network has continued to serve those impacted by the shutdown in addition to the millions of New Yorkers who already struggle every day to afford food even when the federal government is opening, open and functioning properly. During the shutdown, 1.6 million low-income New Yorkers who rely on SNAP received their be February benefits early in mid-January. Um, I think the intention there was a good one as noted earlier, but an unintended effect is that because current SNAP benefits cover about two weeks worth of food for most households, it's created a SNAP gap for recipients who are having to stretch that early disper disbursement over a much longer four to six week time period. Uh, that gap is going to be most evident and intense during the imminent public school mid midwinter break that starts next week. Uh, when children will lose access to up to two free meals per day in school. When cash, benefits, and the generosity of family and friends have been exhausted, the emergency food network is the resource of last resort for those struggling to keep food on the table. 
especially in the face of the unprecedented serious threats from the federal government, we urge the city to advance the budgetary and legislative supports needed to ensure that the city's crucial and already strained anti-hunger safety net remains intact for another fiscal year. The bottom line is that these federal attacks are hitting the New Yorkers who are already our most vulnerable the hardest by a bad federal policy coming at us from multiple fronts. Threats to safety and resident status, sufficient consistent individual income, benefits eligibility and access, affordable health care, and by extension to non-negotiables like uh, uh, for living like food and housing. For the purposes of this hearing, this means that more than ever, we as New Yorkers must use the collective local power we have to do what we have always done historically, to work together in solidarity, using our leadership and wisdom in government and in the Charitable Emergency Food Network to collaborate and strengthen the effective systems and initiatives that protect our neediest, so that for our tired, our poor, our tempest-tossed, and our hungriest, who are also, like all of us, New Yorkers, our city remains the reliable sanctuary it has always been. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Joel Berg, CEO of Hunger Free America. I've submitted encyclopedic uh, testimony for the record, so I won't read it, but I will make a, a few key points in response to uh, the other points made in the hearing. First, the question of liability for food donors. I'm sure our colleagues from City Harvest will discuss this, but understand federal law and state law protect good faith donors against liability. That's a non-issue. To Chairman Levin, you asked about whether Congress can do something about the proposed public charge rule and the proposed ABOD rule. They don't have to approve it. The Trump administration can do without without them, but I want to say for the record, like any other regulation, Congress does have the constitutional ability to oversee it, overrule it. I don't expect this current Senate would do so, but I would hope we'd push the House to do so, and if the Senate doesn't, we should get a new Senate. I, I, I want to make, a, 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 in a nonpartisan way, representing my nonpartisan organization. Uh, and I, I just mentioned this to Councilman Traeger, but I hope they have separate hearings on the school breakfast in New York City. I know this has been a big issue of yours for a long time. There's a new report out by our colleagues of Share Our Strength, and New York City is still dragging. The mayor said that we were going to do in-classroom breakfast for all elementary schools. The reality is that's still not happening, and we're still not significantly expanded to middle schools. As of the 2017-2018 school year, 44 0.6% of the kids who got school lunch got school breakfast. Less than half the kids in New York City who got school lunch got school breakfast. Some, some cities now are above 100%. Now state law mandates that all high-need schools in New York City do it. We're going to follow up with the Board of Education and the Mayor's Office, but I hope the council can really push them to get on the stick. We are losing federal funds while kids are going hungry. It makes no sense whatsoever. On college student hunger, I want to follow up on what some of my colleagues have said. The least effective way to fight college student hunger are food pantries. It sort of grills me that, uh, I don't know if that's a word in this context, but that we're using the worst response first. The top response should be using federally funded nutrition assistance benefits. Just to clarify, for the governor to say that every community college in the state qualifies for the work requirement for SNAP does not require USDA to approve it or even review it. The governor can just do it by administrative fiat through OTDA tomorrow. It would not cost the state a penny. Other states have done, including states run by Republican governors. And particularly with the current House of Representatives, it's not like they're going to overrule this. And I can go into details with staff later about how this needs to happen, but they can do it overnight just by clarifying this. Secondly, uh, we also need to better use work study requirements. If we know that one hour of work study allows people to qualify for these programs for SNAP, then if we have 100 hours of work study, instead of giving one student 100 hours, we should give 10 students 10 hours and make sure they all get SNAP. And then we should fund feeding programs on campus through the feeding halls and pantries where kids have to, or students have to take food back, uh, you know, dozens of miles on public transportation back home, taking food that someone else picked for them. And lastly, I'll see some colleagues from Columbia here, my alma mater, there endowment is $10 billion. Their president earns $4 million, four times the president of the United States. They can make sure their workers and their students don't go hungry. They should do it tomorrow without a penny of more government funds. They should just make sure every private institution in New York with zillions of dollars should make sure that their students and workers don't hungry by, by, by paying their workers enough and by making sure they have enough money and financial aid. Thank you. Wow. Thanks, Joel. Double microphones.
Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Glass. I work for City Harvest. I'm the uh, Agency Operations Manager, uh, and I would like to address the Chairperson's Baron Levin and the Committees on General Welfare and Higher Education, and thank you for this opportunity. So you've heard a lot about hunger and food insecurity, specifically around the SNAP issue. Two things that I want to point out that have not been mentioned this afternoon is that our agency programs have been seeing upwards of 30% of increasing clients and serving clients who have never had to access emergency food uh, in the past, specifically due to the shutdown and the formerly furloughed workers. Um, specifically, programs in Staten Island have seen an intake of 100 plus clients in one day given their proximity to the port and members of the Coast Guard. City Harvest has uh, response has been that the mobile markets um, that are in all five boroughs are open to the formerly furloughed and federal workers free of charge. They just need to show their IDs. We've packed um, numbers of bags of produce and non-perishable items distributed to TSA workers both in LaGuardia Airport and through a partner agency holding hands at the JFK Airport. We've provided additional produce to three of our agencies, two in Staten Island, one in Queens, and we've received a small modest grant to help agencies in high need, high SNAP recipient neighborhoods to purchase food from one of our vendors. Um, but this is not enough, as we've all heard this afternoon. So here's our call to action. Number one, open feeding centers such as those available during the summer months to provide breakfast and lunches for New York City public school children next week. If there are centers available, then that inf information needs to be made public. Um, number two, to advocate for enhanced SNAP benefits and the call on the council to, com uh, to comment on the ABOD rulemaking process. As we've heard this afternoon, um, it's really untenable situation. Um, to provide $15 million for SNAP incentives, specifically to help New Yorkers afford fresh fruits and vegetables by expanding such programs as health bucks. And work together with our network and other food funders to provide capital grants and food assistance to the network of community programs who often operate on a shoestring budget with limited infrastructure. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ariel Savransky. I'm a policy and advocacy advisor at UJA Federation. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify as well as for your tireless advocacy for uh, increased funding for food insecurity. Um, so I'm just gonna summarize a few things from my testimony. Uh, first, we urge the city to continue to invest in expanding the anti-hunger safety net uh, by continuing to take steps to expand enrollment in programs such as SNAP. The governor included in his executive budget announcement this year uh, programs to make it easier for older adults to enroll in SNAP, as well as to um, improve screening tools, especially at physicians' offices, and also to enroll in an online pilot that would allow um, individuals to use their benefits, their SNAP benefits online. So once these are rolled out, if there's funding, we would urge the city to work with the state to make sure that these initiatives are publicized. Um, second, we'd like to thank you for your advocacy related to the Emergency Food Assistance Program, specifically um, securing the $8.7 million increase last year. Obviously, the need is still there, and so we hope you'll continue to advocate for increases to this funding. Um, also, along those lines, it is essential that the city invest in resources to ensure that food pantries are equipped with enough food to serve their clients, especially culturally competent foods such as halal and kosher meals. Um, one thing I'll bring up that hasn't been discussed yet is that it is imperative that the city invest in agencies that run congregate or home delivered meal programs. Um, so com congregate and home delivered meals are funded by the city currently at a rate of 20% less per meal than the national average. Um, additional investment <coughs> is needed to increase the rate to be adequately on par with the national average, which was, would allow agencies to provide culturally competent meals, adequately fund staffing, and address the unfunded costs of running senior center kitchens so that seniors can eat nutritious and coach culturally competent meals. Um, we would also urge the city to think about ways to support UJA Federation's digital pantry system and hubs. Um, these have been discussed in the past few years. Um, our system is now being piloted at three pantries with the goal of expanding it to an additional 14 in the coming years. Um, through this system, we have already begun to see the intended results. 
The number of people served has increased significantly, especially among families with young children. Uh, one of our digital pantries has seen usage triple. Wait times are down and pantries are able to stay open for longer hours, making them more accessible. Um, furthermore, the amount of protein and fresh fruits and vegetables has also increased exponentially in our pantries. Um, so we urge the City Council to continue to think creatively about ways to increase access to this food um, and also explore ways to open the city procurement process to those entities operating under kosher supervision so that agencies purchasing kosher food can benefit from economies of scale. Um, we are also very supportive of increased efforts to fight hunger on college campuses. That was discussed extensively, so I won't go into that here. Um, so thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Nice. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Rachel Sabella. I'm the director of No Kid Hungry New York with Share Our Strength. I want to be very brief today. Um, I do have to say, though, when I walked into the lobby this morning and saw it completely full with people coming up here, listening to your remarks, Chair Levin, listening to Chair uh, to Councilman Grudenchik's remarks, we've come so far. Um, and I think it's something that we should all be very proud of. We still have a long way to go, but due to your leadership and due to the united front of all these organizations, when you see what we've been able to do to start breakfast in the classroom, to expand universal school meals, to put the increase in EFAP, to be able to talk about what people need with SNAP, and to go against the federal government and advocate for things, we are very lucky. And so we thank you for that, and I know we will all continue to work that way. Um, I have written remarks, which I will pass around, but for me, I think the biggest thing today is, as the council goes through their budget season, as the council looks at opportunities, we need to be supporting people, and we need to be putting attention at these programs programs. For so many people these days, and especially as we look at childhood hunger, there is so much fear. So whether it's parents not taking advantage of school meal programs, or parents not knowing about the existence of summer meal programs, we need to put our energies into putting awareness out, helping people to take advantage of this. I think what Joel said about school breakfast, let's not leave money on the table. This is money that's out there. We know that when kids are in the classroom and eating and nobody's judging, nobody's saying you're poor and eating in the cafeteria, the difference that it makes. And I think especially now, again, as people are afraid, as people are fighting for their lives, we need to do everything we can to ensure that they have food, that their children have food. Um, we at Share Our Strength stand at the ready to work with you in the council, and I thank you again for your leadership. Thank you, Rachel. Um, so I want to thank this entire panel um, for all the work that you continue to do. Uh, <clears throat> I know that uh, your testimony has a lot of other uh, recommendations and ideas um, that we look forward to incorporating. Um, and we, on the areas that we can, on the areas that we can have an impact, um, whether it's on the, some of the federal stuff or the state stuff, um, the council wants to be a partner in advocacy, and uh, and so you, uh, please let's uh, let's make sure over the coming months that um, we're working closely together, um, and I'll do my part to ensure that my colleagues are informed and and are taking uh, the necessary advocacy roles as well and also communicating with the speaker um, and, and making sure that, um, that where we need to, to go to the mayor, go to the governor, go to Congress, um, go to our, our, our colleagues in the House, um, uh, we'll be able to do that. So thank you so much. Thank you for, for your time and for, for staying so long. We're, we're approaching almost hour four here. Um, so uh, we really appreciate everybody's patience on this. Thank you. OK, we have two more panels. Uh, next panel, Wendy O'Shields from Safety Net Activists. Michael Higgins, the food pantry at Columbia. Medhat Garris from Hunger Free New York City. Zamir Hassan, Muslims Against Hunger, Hunger Van. And then, is it, is it Larissa Wright? You know way? Is Mr. Hassan, Samir Hassan? I have to leave. Maybe. Okay. Uh, Reverend Robert Ennis Jackson. Okay. And then if Mr. Hassan comes back, we'll make sure to have him on the next panel. Okay. 
My name is Wendy O'Shields. I am a New York City welfare and homeless rights advocate working with the Urban Justice Safety Net Project and activist. I support intro bill T-2019-3640, oversight reducing uh, food insecurity in New York City. New York City homeless, no and low income individuals and families, disabled, unemployed, underemployed, emancipated youth, college students, elderly, rent or, bur or debt burdened, and those with ca catastrophic medical expenses are hungry. These populations choose between their most urgent bills or skipped or a skipped inadequate meal. Many New Yorkers su suffer quietly behind closed doors with gross malnutrition, vitamin deficiencies, and hunger because they're poor. Regular missed meals or meager meals lead to a multitude of long-term expensive health challenges. Additionally, um, Bill 3640 should consider setting aside funding for urban farming incentives with a focus on community and rooftop gardens. Encourage individual windowsill gardens for herbs and other easily grown edible plants. This will allow for fresh produce in-house. Consider allocating funding for more funding for health bucks, a fresh food and vegetable farmer's market coupon program run by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. The Health Bucks program should be further developed, expanded, and brought to a larger audience of eligible New Yorkers. Advertise the New York City Five Borough Food Program on the MTA subway, AM, and Metro daily newspapers, and frequently run a PSA on NYC New York One. I thank you for considering my suggestions to reduce hunger in the city of New York. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Higgins. I am a third year GS student studying urban studies and specialize in geographic information systems. I am also the co-founder and chair of the Food Pantry at Columbia. Um, Columbia University is one of the eight Ivy League institutions in the country, and we are, the Food Pantry at Columbia is the only pantry that is run by students in the Ivy League, um, Ivy League institution. I want to thank um, uh, Chair Levin, Chair Barron, and all the council members for the opportunity to testify here today. And I'm gonna give a brief um, history of the Food Pantry, and then talk very briefly about some of the things that I would like to see going forward in our, in our um, next chapters. Uh, the Food Pantry at Columbia was formed in May 2016 in a collaborative effort between the General Studies Student Council and the First Generation Low Income Partnership. Our mission is very simple, relieve hunger, in, you know, relieve hunger on our campus through the acquisition and distribution of both perishable and non-perishable food to those who need it. And this includes students and Columbia affiliates. So um, just to give everyone a, a heads up, this is something that we have found out that not only students are utilizing this, um, this resource, but also Columbia affiliates as well, whether they are administrators or work study students or uh, of that nature. Um, during its development, GS, um, GSSC and FLIP uh, determined that there was a, um, an issue within the School of General Studies in relation to hunger. As a small test pilot, GSSC allocated $1,000 to purchase food, advertise on, small, on social media, and reserve space to distribute the food. Before the end of the first week of the test, we realized that hunger extends beyond the borders of the School of General Studies. And it, it was at that point that we decided to make this a larger, more, more formal um, uh, situation. And less than three years later, the Food Pantry at Columbia is a self-contained university-recognized rec university student group with an eight-person board, seven committees, and an average of 200, um, 200 committee members, 200 volunteers per year. 
our data shows that not only do we have a significant reach within, within the School of General Studies, but we also have a significant reach across the entire university. Only one of the 21 schools within the university have, um, has not utilized the pantry in some capacity, <coughs> shape, or form. And this is more pronounced this particular semester at the start of this, um, this calendar year, where it looks like the entire undergraduate school, uh, undergraduate schools, all four undergraduate schools, as well as the, as well as some of the um, graduate schools and professional schools are now utilizing the pantry at a higher rate. And one of the things that we need going forward in our next chapter is an access to, to SNAP, um, SNAP options. We are partnered with, excuse me, we are a member of the Food Bank for New York City, and this allows us to purchase our food at a much lower cost than it would if we are doing a, um, purchasing through retail establishments or even the school's um, wholesale provider, Cisco. Um, that's one option that we have in relation to the, the Food Bank for New York City. The Food Bank for New York City also allows us to, um, to provide students with the option to apply for SNAP. However, because vast majority of students who would apply for SNAP would be turned down because they don't necessarily qualify, this is something that we would like to um, have a larger discourse going forward as to what exactly what we can do to make this process better for all students. Um, I do have my, um, my written testimony presented to the council, and I would appreciate any follow-up um, that you may have. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. Thanks for all of you, and thanks for the uh, Hunger Free New York City organization for inviting me today to speak to the Hunger Welfare Committee today. My name is Mithat Gars, and I'm no anchor member of Hunger New York City Food Actions Board. For the past five years, as members, we advocate for SNAP benefits for low-income individuals who depend on SNAP benefits, as well as, as the generosity of food pantries and soup kitchens in New York City. During these past five years, I have volunteered at my local community pantries and soup kitchen drives in Staten Island to help other families put food on their table. During these years, I have seen hundreds of people in my community struggling coming into the pantries to get food for the week and to eat. At our community, soup kitchen is, is sometimes their only option. There are too many families and people living in poverty, in shelters, and living in food insecurity. I have seen senior citizens, unemployed people, immigrants from many countries, and people from every denomination and religious backgrounds, as well as, as veterans, disabled people, and single mothers, single men, family. Food insecurity does not discriminate. They are all suffer. Coming to the pantry just to eat and share food with their family. They all need to eat and they all need to be fed. Food stamps, as well as, as food kitchens, and food pantries need to be well funded nationwide, priority until we end hunger in this country. I want you all of you to just remember last month how many federal employees were not being paid and were forced to go to all pantries around just to eat because of the government shutdown. I'm here today to load the welfare committee and all of you and all of those who in attendance to know that our low-income people and seniors, as well as well our children and all of those who are vulnerable in our society need to eat. And that SNAP programs, as well as community food pantries and soup kitchens need to be well-funded and need to remain open all year, all year around, just to help families in need. No woman, man, or child, citizen of the great state of New York should go hungry. And Congress should both expand SNAP eligibility and increase benefit. All Ottomans for SNAP by adopting the uh, moderate cost food plan. Thank you.
Good afternoon. And happy Valentine's Day. <laughs> My name is Larissa Wright, the Director of Crisis and Housing Supports at United Way of New York City. Thank you, Chairperson Levin and Chairperson Barron, um, as well as the committee members for holding today's hearing. For nearly 80 years, United Way of New York City has worked to support vulnerable New Yorkers throughout the five boroughs, fighting for health, education, and financial stability um, of every New Yorker. We partnered with the Women's Center for Education and Career Advancement and City Harvest to release the 2000, 2018 The Self-Sufficiency Standards for New York City, a study that determines the required income to achieve, to achieve economic independence in each of the boroughs. We found that two in five working age New York City households, or over 2.5 million individuals, lack income to cover just the basic necessities food, housing, health care, and child care. Between 2000 and 2018, the cost of these basic needs rose nearly three times the rate of wages. 84% of households not earning enough income to make ends meet have at least one working adult. The report showed that food costs have increased an average of 68% across New York City with dramatic differences within the boroughs. As we all know, when the grocery budget is insufficient, families su supplement with private and public assistance. Yet, according to the report, only 31% of New York City families below the standard receive SNAP. This put a tremendous strain on the New York City's emergency food system. To address these challenges, United Way of New York City provides program funding and capacity building supports to food pantries and soup kitchens, shelters, and emergency rent mortgage and utility payments to households and SNAP enrollment. United Way of New York City, one of the leaders of New York City Food Assistant Collaborative, whose mission is to direct emergency food resources effectively and efficiently. Out of this effort, Plentiful was born. This app was, <coughs> excuse me, this app for emergency food providers and their clients has improved how food insecure New Yorkers can locate emergency food in their area make a reservation, and easily pick up food at a scheduled time. It allows pantries to better manage their operations and communicate with clients in nine languages. To date, Plentiful has reached about 25% of households that use the emergency food services. We urge the council to increase emergency food assistance programs, EFAP's baseline food funding to 22 million to fully fund this work. We urge the council to con continue its support to HRA's efforts, enabling New Yorkers to apply for several benefits simultaneously. We also urge the council to expand funding for New York City's health book programs. The greater driver of increased self-sufficiency is higher wages. New York's, New York's move to $15 minimum wage made a powerful difference for many, but we need to ensure these gains are not lost over time. We urge the council to work with state lawmakers to support efforts to index wages annually. And lastly, we know how critical education is to lifelong success. We applaud the city and state's recent efforts to ensure that hunger is not a barrier for those seeking higher education. Thank you. I wanna thank the panel. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, we have a Hello, my name is Reverend Robert Ince Jackson. I represent Brooklyn Rescue Mission Urban Harvest Center. We've been feeding families for 18 years. Our present, we have 1,800, fa uh, 1800 families registered. We do 365,000 meals a year. We're not at large uh, from a pantry standpoint. Um, where we established in a storefront style, which is like a grocery store. And we did that for a reason. It's an appointment, a uh, pantry, customer choice, where people get to choose their food off the shelves like a store, but it also looks like a store. And that reason is because in my community, there's one black person of color that owns a grocery store. That most of our folks that are community-based are not used to going into a store or having someone looks like them producing a product or selling the product. <laughs> in our program at Brooklyn Rescue Mission, we have urban farms. We have two sites where we grow food. We have the food pantry. We also have done farmer's markets in our community for nine years. Uh, we need funding for that because that's a very difficult part of our program to be able to have funding. We've had over 817 interns 
uh, participate in our program. And one of the reasons why I came to speak today is because that I had eight 117 interns, I think 80% of them were food insecure. The, I like uh, uh, Ms. Barron's uh, statement, they're hungry. Uh, uh, Mr. Levy and you and Ms. Barron are handling this conference very well today, by the way. What I've learned is that the project that we put in place uh, with working with young people is very important. In our program at Brooklyn Rescue Mission at our food pantry, we have access for, access for young people without stigma. That, uh, I heard Gerald, Joel Berg say that food pantries don't do it a certain way, but when you have a community-based pantry where you have young people in communities who are food insecure, when they go to a pantry they don't have stigma, they're going to do less criminal activities to, to, to provide food for themselves. But you have a pantry where it's like a grocery store. That's what we do. The 817 interns have come from high schools, come from CUNY where they were paid or volunteered, have come from master's programs, including Columbia, uh, where they did uh, dietitian work to help us in, uh, improve how we gave out foods to our clients. Uh, what I like to be able to see is an increased component of funding from the city council that allows local pantries to be able to work with youth around food in communities. That's what we've been doing for 18 years. We've seen so many young people who are involved in the food pantry understand how to defeat the poverty that's in their households. Not only are they bringing the foods back, but they're getting a jump on, on understanding of why it's important for them to get that education. So they're able to complete the high school alternative program, are able to go back and work on studying harder at the college. And we have one of our interns that was a graduate intern that's now on our board. We would like to be able to help, your help, in having local pro pro programs get items in place to be able to help young people around their community where they have no stigma, even before they get to college. Thank you. Good. I want to thank the panel. Where exactly is uh, your facility located? We're in Central Brooklyn, and we serve Bushwick. What's the address? Uh, uh, nine nine one nine Gates Avenue. Okay, I know where you are. Okay, and uh, to Mr. Higgins, how do you fund the food pantry at Columbia, and what is your budget? a great question. So the funding comes directly from two main sources, um, monetary um, tax deductible and non-tax deductible um, donations that come from individuals as well as uh, student organizations within the university. But then also, um, as was alluded to by um, another, another student, um, comes from student fees. That's something that we don't like. But at the same time, because of the fact that um, there are institutions within the university that, um, that do contribute monetary funding, those fundings only come from one source, which is um, student fees. Mm -hmm. That's something that we're going to be looking into uh, to resolving in the future. Yeah. And right now, that's why we have options for um, tax-deductible monetary donations as well. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you You're to welcome. the panel. Appreciate your testimony. Thank you to this panel. We have, we have one final panel, uh, Jason Hilliard from Community Food Advocates. Also, I want to thank that panel for their patience uh, and the upcoming panel for their patience. Judith uh, Seacon from New York Community Pantry, New York Common Pantry, Amy Blumsack from Neighbors Together, and if Mr. Zamir Hassan has returned. Okay. And just those three. And if anyone else wishes to testify, uh, please sign up with the Sergeant at Arms because this will be the final panel.
whoever wants to begin. Okay. Good afternoon. I'm Judy Seacon, Senior Director of Programs and Operations for New York Common Pantry. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony and for your successful effort to increase EFAP and your continued support for reducing hunger in the city. New York Common Pantry is a multi-service community organization that connects New Yorkers struggling with food insecurity to essential resources. We provide healthy groceries, meals, nutrition education, SNAP enrollments, tax return prep, and supplementary food for seniors. We are starting our second five-year plan to increase our services through mobile and school pantries and to increase the availability of healthy food choices and to have more food rescue opportunities. Our first plan helped us to extend our services from one location in East Harlem throughout Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. Support from the City of New York has been essential and allowed us to serve close to half a million visitors, partner with over 120 sites across New York City, serve over 6 million meals, and assist residents in obtaining over 8.6 million in resources last year. When 19% of the city's soup kitchens closed, we were ready to increase the number of our hot meals we served by 30%. We were ready to serve furloughed federal workers instantly. We were ready to serve more Bronx residents at our second location and increased our services by 50%. We were ready for an 80% spike in the number of families we served across both our pantries just last week because of the SNAP gap. We have seen great empathy for the federal workers who have recently been affected by the government shutdown, but the people we serve day in and day out deserve the same empathy and ongoing committed responses as they struggle to get by in New York City. In order for New York Common Pantry and other emergency food providers in the city to remain ready to serve, we must be able to rely not just on EFAP, but also on the council through its various funding lines, and we call on the mayor to increase those areas in his budget. EFAP provides us with a steady stream of food, which allows us to leverage other sources to create new service delivery systems essential to reach the food insecure population, but we still are short of what is necessary. We are grateful for your continued support and are eager to find new ways we can continue as your partners in the work we do. Thank you. I just want to, uh, one more person signed up, uh, Karina Santos Taveras, Welfare Rights Initiative. You can go ahead. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you, Chairperson Barron. Thank you, Chairperson Levin, and all the rest of the committee members for the opportunity to testify on food insecurity in New York City. My name is Amy Bloomsack. I'm the Director of Organizing and Policy for Neighbors Together. We are a soup kitchen and community-based organization located in Ocean Hill, Brooklyn. We were founded in 1982, and we've been serving hot meals to people in need for the last 36 years. We serve approximately 80,000 meals a year. Since our founding, we've expanded to two additional programs. Our empowerment program provides stabilizing services to people who come through our doors. And our community action program engages community members in organizing, policy and legislative advocacy, and leadership development. We currently serve over 10,000 unique individuals site-wide. So I want to thank the council and the speaker for their leadership in protecting hungry New Yorkers and securing an increase in baseline food funding for EFAP last year. And I'm here to ask for your continued leadership in the fight against hunger and um, to ask for an additional increase in baseline food, baseline food funding for EFAP to $22 million. Emergency food programs like Neighbors Together, we really rely on EFAP funding, and I think now more than ever with the continued threats to the anti-hunger safety net, we need to know that we will have <coughs> funding to support us if there should be the kind of cuts that have been threatened for the last year and more. Um, many other people already alluded to the, the devastating effects that cuts or rule changes to SNAP could have, the proposed public charge rule change. We think it would increase the number of people coming through the doors of emergency food programs significantly and, and really have incredibly harmful effects for low-income New Yorkers. And we plan on being there to absorb that need and to support New Yorkers in need, but we will also need the support of the council to be able to do that effectively. Um, additionally, as other government funding sources have decreased, we are relying on EFAP more and more to support the people who come through our doors. And so the other thing that I wanted to say is that as we continue to increase our reliance on EFAP and as we are requesting 
needing an increase in EFAP funding, I also wanted to make some recommendations to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of EFAP. Um, one thing that we think would be really helpful is in addition to the baseline food funding increase is to have an increase in the administrative funding because all of the emergency for food programs need operational support to run things smoothly in addition to the food we need to serve to people who come to us for support. Um, also, instituting the choice model would be incredibly helpful for emergency food programs. Um, having the ability to choose the types of food that we receive with our EFAP funding would allow us to provide culturally appropriate plates, healthy, wholesome, nutritious meals with the full um, the food chart, the food pyramid the food plate, the whole plate, whatever it's called now, <laughs> healthy meals, um, and also having ability to be in control of the time and size of the deliveries would be a really common sense solution because across the emergency food network, the agencies vary really drastically in size and ability to absorb deliveries. Um, so, and the last thing I'll say is an increase in access to fresh produce and proteins would be really meaningful for getting healthy food to the people who come through our doors. Everyone deserves a healthy, wholesome, nutritious, and dignified meal, no matter what their income level, and we want to be able to provide that for people. And we can do that with your continued support and leadership in ending hunger in New York City. And so please consider increasing the baseline food funding for EFAP. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Chairs uh, Barron and Levin, uh, for inviting it for this opportunity to speak before you and your colleagues today. My name is Jason Hilliard. I am the Chief of Staff at Community Food Advocate Abroad. Uh, we, lead, we led, excuse me, we led uh, the coalition, which is a broad, diverse coalition uh, for the implementation of universal free lunch throughout all the New York City uh, schools. Uh, so I want to thank you for your support in making that happen last year. Last year was the first year that it was rolled out, and now we're trying to build upon that program. As you know, it's a federal uh, program, uh, <clears throat> so every meal is reimbursable uh, by the federal government, and we feel that there are some advantages that we're leaving on the table and really maximizing this program. And one of those issues uh, that I would like to bring to your attention today is the enhanced cafeteria. Uh, this is a uh, school food ideal uh, that we fell in love with uh, a number of years ago. It's currently in uh, approximately 48 buildings and will grow to 50 buildings over the next year and a half. However, we're trying in this year's capital budget to increase that to 350 schools uh, over a five-year period. Uh, the cost of these enhanced cafeterias are $500,000 per school. And <clears throat> We feel that $175 million in the capital budget uh, would be sufficient in reaching uh, that goal of 350 buildings over a five-year period. The advantages that we have found is that within our cafeterias has been very institutionalized uh, over the years. Uh, the school food ideal enhanced cafeteria really modernizes the cafeteria, making it more of a, a welcoming environment for students. And we have found in our surveys as well in our analysis and getting out to several schools that is received well by the student population. Um, it has increased uh, the student participation rate um, <clears throat> within school, within those schools, uh, especially high schools, uh, by 30 percent. And we feel that the council should take this as a priority, especially this body, and pushing this forward. Thank you. Good, af can, okay. <laughs> Good afternoon. Uh, Thank you so much uh, for allowing me to testify. My name is Karina uh, Santos Tavares. I'm a student at Hunter College. I also represent the Welfare Rights Initiative, which is a, stu a student activist and leadership training organization which supports CUNY students in crisis, providing community <coughs> leadership training and legal advocacy. I would like to express my concern regarding food insecurity among CUNY students uh, such as myself. I have personally experienced food insecurity as a result of financial hardship and I'm not being and not being able to access CUNY pantries at my home campus, Hunter College, because not all CUNY schools provide 
their students in need with food insecurity uh, resources such as food pantries and also cafeteria vouchers. Many students are forced to go without food for a day or more. In 2017, I was personally, I have personally gone to school hungry as a result of my campus, Hunter College, not having available food resources. In addition, I was also not allowed to access food, um, CUNY food pantries and cafeteria vo voucher programs on other campus. Many students, many times I was forced to rely on public food pantries. I would have to miss classes because the pantry's schedule conflicted with my school schedule. To avoid hunger, I took many days off throughout the semester to show up at the opening time of the food pantry, and as a result, my grades were, imp were um, impacted with my GPA lowering. This directly impacted my ability to receive college housing scholarships that are based on my GPA. Furthermore, I do not get any form of financial aid. This includes Excelsior, Pell, and TAP. Because I'm facing tempor temporarily uh, homelessness, I live in the Hunter College dorms. The merit-based academic scholarships I have are what has covered my tuition and has allowed me to have a safe place to stay until my graduation date, uh, which will take place in May 2019. Taking time off from school to potenti and potentially running the risk of losing my funding, my funds to access public pantries is not an effective way to challenge food insecurities among college students, especially single college students. Unlike CUNY pantries, public pantries sometimes do not distribute the same equal amount of food to single able-bodied people as they do for families. I believe that an effective solution to tackle food insecurity among CUNY students is to emulate programs such as the cafeteria voucher, which only three CUNY schools currently have in place, Bronx Community College, Mega Evers, and John Jay, and CUNY pantries on all campus versus a select few, because again, if you go to my school and my school doesn't have a pantry, you can't go to CSI, John Jay, or Lehman. They only serve their own students. Um, another solution, I'm a little sorry. Um, in addition, HRA expanding their definition of housing, which would count college dorms as temporary housing, allowing college students facing food insecurity and homelessness access to the 250 housing allowance as there is, as there is no policy or rule that excludes college dorms from the requirements for the housing allowance. I would like to thank you for allowing me to testify and I greatly appreciate your advocacy work for the community. Thank you. Oh, I want to thank this panel. Um, Mr. Veras, I think uh, your testimony is a, a, a good, um, oh. actually, sorry, we have one more, one more member to testify. But it, uh, I want to thank you for your testimony. Uh, I think it's, it's very impactful. And, and um, certainly uh, the recommendations, including that last recommendation, we'd really like to take that under advisement. Yeah, because I, I currently uh, live in the Hunter dorms, and that's what's allowed me to complete my last semester. If it weren't for that, I would I would have been forced to drop out of school because I was put in that position. But I've tried to access the um, twenty the two fifty housing allowance that HR provides, but they say that I can't get it because I live in a dorm. But it's technically temporary temporary housing. We Is should. That, we will. I, I move out in May, and right. Hunter has a policy where if you are scheduled to move out at a particular date in May when the semester ends and you're still there, you will be charged $150 per day until you move <laughs> out. So I can't like afford to stay after I graduate. <laughs> and I just want to add one last comment um, sure. for the last group that talked about why is it that a lot of students are not accessing um, public assistance. I actually, so with the Welfare Rights Initiative, I work with that population and one of the things that I see is that many times if there's a student with a child, they can't bring the child to the center, so they may not be able to access it. And then another issue is uh, mental health. Many times they go to their local centers and they're told false information. They're told that, you know, you may not qualify, you have to drop out of school. I've personally been told that for me to get benefits, I need to drop out. Yeah. Which is unacceptable. Um, <clears throat> the gentleman from HRA is indicating that he, you know, he'll, he's here to, to maybe speak. Hi. Um, but I want to also congratulate you on graduating in this Thank period. you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, and uh, okay, so uh, Zamir Hassan, uh, is the final final member of the public to testify. Thank you to this entire panel. Thank you. You can go ahead, sir. I, uh, good afternoon. I came here at 10 o'clock and kind of little got tired. And I'm, this is the first time I'm doing something like this. So I need to- Welcome. Uh, I, I need to tell you a little story. I came to United States 50 years ago, went to grad school at, in Ithaca, New York, and I was in IT when there was no IT. So you could see how well I was doing. And part of American dream. Uh, big houses, fast cars, right? Year 2000, I end up going to, first time in my life, to a soup kitchen as a chaperone to my son's school. And I said, wow, they live in my backyard? I didn't even know they existed. And, and, I, and I started talking to myself because my tradition is I'm not supposed to go to bed if my neighbor is hungry. So I started talking to all my friends and that's where this program really started. One thing we discovered, uh, work, uh, so I founded Muslims Against Hunger, and uh, one thing I discovered, the people who are hanging out at the park, uh, at the train station, we were not reaching out to them. And I tried to uh, open my own soup kitchen, and, and I realized that it's a lot of money and a lot of effort. So I created this program called Hunger Van, which is a mobile soup kitchen. And what we do, we, we have a kitchen, access to a kitchen, food is cooked there, and we go in the street and give the food out. And as I was doing that, I realized the issue of student hunger. So uh, we were uh, we, uh, working uh, uh, with Interfaith Community Services in Tomkins Square Park. In 2017, we started a program on the campus of NYU. And uh, don't ask me why and why you, because I'm from the elite, okay? And, and we live in silos, and that's where I could get money to funding. So we, are, we have 5,000 volunteers all over the world now, and we have no institutional funding because our goal is not feeding people. Because one thing I have learned that, uh, uh, the, as, as uh, the chair Barron has said, it's not done yet. So, so I'm taking care, uh, uh, part into something else where I am bringing people who, because everybody wants to do good. They need an opportunity. What Hunger Van has done, has done we bring people at schools and churches and, and have them pack food, have them make food, and we reach out. And in that process, when that is happening, we are educating them. Uh, you know, why is it happening? Am I hungry? What is hunger? You know, how many people are hungry? And people, uh, when I tell them it's 38 million or 49 million in this country, their jaw drop. Because one of the issue is that uh, institutions can do the best. I mean, thank you very much for all these people who are here and doing work here and you guys. So, but it has to be at grassroots level. People have to be educated at every level. And we are doing program with the, with high schools. We are doing programs uh, with the colleges, and we are bringing them together. Like one of the issues they were discussing uh, earlier, uh, I was here. The college program uh, that they can't reach out to students, and they are not coming to their program. They have that stuff. Uh, so what I would do as a suggestion, I'm going to uh, follow up with them. I'll do an event at the college, where we'll bring all the people who wants to help out, and we'll make food and give that food to their food pantry. And uh, so, so there is, has to be a lot of education on the ground, in addition to everything else which is happening. The government is doing it, church is doing it, all these guys are doing it. So there, ha there is a missing piece of education because we live in silos. You know, uh, I didn't know they exist. You know, uh, I thought that they, they live somewhere else. And that's what, especially the community, my community is a new community, and they got a lot of money. And guess what they are doing? They're sending it uh, to wherever they came from. And, and what I have been successful uh, doing that, take their money and spend it here. 
because they uh, because uh, as part of my tradition i'm supposed to give so much money uh, you know uh, every year from my income so i'm trying to direct that money into uh, because where is all this money it's in suburb and 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 what i'm trying to do bring that money into the cities so uh, so so uh, essentially uh, everything you guys are doing great but there has to be education piece and i'm trying to address that because i come from educational background myself thank you very much mr hassan thank you any questions by the, by the way uh, in last year all the numbers are there we have served 60000 meals mm. uh, and and with this uh, nyu program which started uh, 17 we have served there uh, at washington square park right there about 15000 meals and and we we are only two days a week and we are planning to do it every day we commend That's you for your service and uh, for your insight and we thank you for coming thank you thanks for having me here Out. Do you want to, do you want to uh, there being no further witnesses, this hearing is adjourned. Thank you. I got a.